a Microsoft engineer, a former Microsoft engineer uh, called Dave Plummer. And he's uh, got a, a series called Dave's Garage. And okay. he, he goes through and, and like talks about, you know, various bits of Windows history and things like that. Like mm-hmm. he worked on the code into port. Do you remember the old uh, pinball that used to be in Windows 95, 98? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Space Cadet Pinball. So he, mm-hmm. he ported the code over from uh, from that onto the Windows NT platform. Okay. Ready for like XP and things. And it was loads of little little bits like that. It goes into all of these kind of, you know, background insights. And uh, there was a video of his I was watching the other day that was talking about, it was um, benchmarking the modern CPUs against things like the, uh, you know, the, the computer that landed men on the moon type thing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's so, incredible. It's talking about you know MIPS versus flops for um, you know millions of instructions per second versus floating point operations and you know how they compare to each other and then how you know like not point four MIPS for the Apollo landing computer up to oh, yeah, millions I mean, of MIPS on modern computers. You know and I, th- th- those th- kind th- of high tech from the seventies or if, like even going back to the sixties. Yeah, that's it's it is incredible, and I remember that being at a LAN party where a buddy of mine bought himself a new PC, and it, he was he had a hard drive with four gigabytes, and the other buddy was walking up and he's like four gigabytes, man, you're never gonna need that much memory, <laughs> uh, not memory but hard drive, <laughs> like, storage. Yeah. You're never gonna need that much storage. There's no game where you would need. That. <laughs> well, I, I, I used to back in the days when I used, I used to run an IT business. I, I was using um, a bit of software called HyperOS yep. that would allow you to do um, multi-boot systems very efficiently and do okay. weird and wonderful things. Like you, you could, you could. Uh, they had a hyperdrive mode that would allow if you if you were running a Windows nine x nine x platform, so ninety five, ninety eight, or ME. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a FAT16 partition, so less than two gig yep. partition size. Um, if you could cram the installation down small enough, stripping out all the non-essential rubbish, you could yep. then, as part of the um, the boot process, what it would do is it would it would intercept the boot boot process, create a RAM drive, okay, sector copy the entire partition into the RAM drive, and then boot from that RAM drive instead. Oh, so like the first SSD. Loaded yeah, with RAM. exactly. Yeah, so this would this would have been back in. Oh, God, I can't think how far back it would have been. Um, early 2000, 2001, 2002 maybe. Okay. And um, I bought a new PC, and uh, I, it wasn't one of their options. But I rang them up, and I was just like, "Right, we, we want we want to buy this machine, but can you make it? Can you put seven hundred and sixty eight mega RAM in it?" Because that's that's not an option on your list. You can only have up to five twelve. And let's see, there's three slots. Can we have seven sixty eight? Yeah. And the re- the response back was just, "Are you sure?" Yeah. Like, yes. Are, are you yes, confused? I am, yeah. Are you confusing <laughs> mem with hard disk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean that's the thing. It was it was a forty gig hard drive, and I, I had a, a Windows XP partition running for like the main daily driver something, mm. and then I had this this super stripped down. Um, copy of Windows ninety eight, all of the rubbish stripped out, yeah. and just uh, get rid of all the drivers and everything you don't need. Everything on it. you didn't need. Yeah. Had it down to, to, uh, just shy of five hundred meg was the total install. Yep. And uh, I could run that in a in a RAM drive then. So it's a five twelve meg RAM drive. So you are running, it was basically it was an instant boot, and because it was in memory, which is volatile, it meant that anything that happened. You just reboot the machine, and nothing gets saved to disk anyway. Yeah, we, we so, kind of did those installations back then too, but not to load it off the memory. It was just faster to install, because exactly, when you go yeah. to a LAN party with like I don't know two, three hundred people sitting there, it only takes that one idiot with the virus. Well, obviously, like everyone had one, and it would just mm-hmm. spread through. So you would usually install your computer like two or two or three times over those two days <laughs> just a complete fresh install so you would have your cds with drivers and your windows condensed down <laughs> and you just start saying yep okay now it starts killing stuff time for <laughs> for an install yep we used to do that with um it was uh command and conquer red alert 2 back when i was at college 
and we'd um, we modified the install so that it would it was a pre-installed version with map packs and updates and all the rest of stuff and the, the um, computers at my old college mm -hmm. they were running a bit of security software that would do a similar sort of thing you know it was, it was kind of like a, a saved state so the the student could do whatever they needed to do you reboot the machine instead of log out it reboot and it would reset the whole machine back to the pre-save state yep. so it basically meant whatever you installed any stuff you messed around with because it was a it was proper IT suites for all that kind of stuff everything would be reset so we had these um, these installed disks that were you know preset for network games the whole lot and we just have between the few of us who would play we just had these uh, I'd written batch scripts that would do the full install and patch it and put the map packs on and yeah everything and for us just... so we unfold your um, paper where there's like the activation code of Windows like <laughs> well, this, this was just, just, this was just the for the game so this this was uh, we just had a, a few copies of it so we just put okay. it all in because you, you could you could install the game on a few machines and, and yeah play with uh, oh, I remember that so we just had it so that it would just do the whole thing for us so yeah, we're going nice. like it, lunch hours and things get it get it installed on like five or six machines and then all of us jump on before we get kicked okay. out of the room <laughs> Yep, I remember that we had a two at school where you would, when you reboot the computer, it would basically erase everything on the hard drive that's not supposed to be there. Uh -huh. So we would have our discs and CD-ROMs and just like install it, play something, and then it get thrown off. That was actually good days and um, something unheard of today where you actually were able to buy a game and legally install it on different computers and the multiplayer would work. Not the single player that you needed the activation key for, but there were a mm -hmm. couple of games where you could actually play the multiplayer on it. Yeah. If I remember right, I think Battlezone was one of them. That was from like 98. Same time yeah. as Half-Life. <laughs> yep. Sorry, you haven't, been, you haven't been able to get a word in edgeways there yet, Andy, have you? <laughs> yeah, sorry, Andy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I can remember the days when my first PC had 10 megahertz processor. That was... That would have been 89? Yeah. 1989, right. not 1889. <laughs> um, that was back when you had a computer. Yeah, it had, it had a total of 20 megabytes of uh, hard drive storage. Total. Yep. Which I never filled. Never filled. I mean, it, yeah. Uh, it's the industry, <laughs> right? If they you give, them, give them more hard, like hard drive space and they're going to fill it up. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 couldn't, it couldn't do graphics. Yeah, I mean, I the best say, graphics yeah, were kind of, yeah, it was, yeah. it was ASCII, ASCII ASCII images, yeah. yeah. Good, you couldn't like build it out of letters, thing. then yeah, yeah you, you, you weren't going to be seeing anything interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now the, the uh, that was the what the floppy disk in the black and green screen. Yep, yeah, remember yeah, five, and five and quarters, those. yeah, five and quarters. <laughs> That the, was, little, uh, the little lock yep. that would go on the front yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, I, I was lucky I had a double sided drive on mine Ooh. yeah I love the yeah. five and a half ones because uh, it got quite hot and you can just use a <laughs> fan air with it <laughs> I there was a um, reason why they were called floppy well that, that was the thing so like yeah. Yeah. Um, for the people who hadn't grown up with the five and a quarters and I'd only ever seen the three and a halves being called floppy disks. And going, well, these aren't floppy; these are solid plastic. What you, what you on about? You know, <laughs> that happened to be delicately explained to that. You no, know, the old ones they they were really floppy. <laughs> yeah, Dave, oh, Dave really Bauer in the chat has mentioned what about the eight-inch floppies? And yeah, I I can remember at the time that I had my PC, I actually bought it off a guy in work. Um, and the place I worked was a magnetic media manufacturer. It was um, a changed name. Oh, I changed name several times. It was uh, Control Data. Also, when I joined them, they were Zydex, uh, who's one of the kind of the, the quite common uh, floppy disk manufacturers. Then it changed to Anacomp. 
that was an American company. Mm. But we mostly made, we didn't make discs, we made tape. So we made half, half inch tape for kind of data storage, uh, yeah. long term mm-hmm. data storage. So that was that was quite fun. I spent quite a lot of time sort of, my job was involving things like reverse engineering other manufacturers <laughs> to find out what they what they were doing. Professional <laughs> copier. <laughs> Getting ideas, reverse engineering to find out, yeah, you know, what their what their um, capabilities of their product, and yeah, you know, whether we could match it. Nerdy thief. It's, <laughs> it's creative business, finding creative ways to copy someone else's work without getting in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah but yeah. what was really interesting that I only went up there a few times. They had a, a loft, which was their archive storage of stuff. And it was a fascinating place because there were things like, yeah, there were eight inch drives up there and stacks of eight inch floppies and there were old hard drive platters. So literally kind of, you know, I don't know, mm. 40 centimeters across, 35 centimeters across plastic domes. And they were kind of, you held, they, there was a little lock on them and inside you could see kind of these huge aluminium platens. And I've still got somewhere, I, I, there were a few things, yeah, things get, thrown away and you kind of go okay everyone and if, so i've got somewhere i've still got some uh hard drive platens that were mm-hmm. not magnetized so they were they were polished aluminium amazingly okay. smooth m- and amazingly shiny um yeah i, I used to when i was yeah, doing I I them. like data destruction and stuff i used to just take them all out um, so i've still got stacks of the of them from like old three and a half inch you know, IDE drives and stuff, um, and they're, they're really, really fun to use to polish each other. Because you know, if you have fingerprints on them and stuff, and you can just rub two together to repolish the surfaces and stuff. Okay. Yeah, they're very, very fun, interesting little bits of kit. And of course, the yeah. magnets are always handy. My fir- my first school, I, 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 when I joined it, as well as teaching science, I was tasked with teaching ICT. Which was fun because for the first six months, we didn't have access to any computers. Um, I had one in, I kind of, I, yeah, I had one in my room. No projectors in those days. Uh, it, was, it was a disaster, really. It was like, right, let's define lots of computer terms. <laughs> that was a, that was about it. Yep. And uh, well, but the ICT technician, his office was in the kind of what would have been the prep room behind, at the back of my lab. So to get to his office, he used to have to walk through the lab, which is fine. I, I didn't mind kind of the member of staff walking through and doing things. But what was really cool about that is I can go, well, I'm thinking, have you got any old broken hard drives I could have? Have you got any of this? Have you got any of that? And it was like, so I'd had bits of computers sort of stuck to the wall but it's really quite useful because of course in a, a the platen inside a hard drive is, is very very shiny uh-huh. very good mirror uh-huh. so i had these bits of hard drive kind of hanging off the, the wall next to my board which some of the students didn't realize made very good mirrors <laughs> but they were convinced that I had eyes in the back of my head because I'd be kind of writing on the board. And it was the sort of school where you kind of generally didn't want to turn your back on the students, <laughs> or certainly with some classes. So I'd be going things like, yeah, George, put it down. Like, what? 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we, I think we were one of the first classes that had IT lessons at school. And the teacher was one year before retirement, <laughs> who they put in that class. So we learned like the typewriter typing on the PC. And we just used the hell out of NetSend, used the internet basically to download all of our movies, games, everything that was going on at that time, what you could get <laughs> over the internet. And when he tried to get us in check, we basically we at one point we found out that he didn't set BIOS password, and none of the PCs. <laughs> oh, rookie! Well, mistake. we took that off his hands. Yeah, and then when he didn't get when 
people couldn't log into Windows anymore because we set uh, a, a boot password on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we told them that we could probably fix it, but we'll need a couple of hours. So we stayed in after school, just logged in and downloaded more stuff. And after that, we just uh, <laughs> set the set the password back. And I would say, yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but we got it done, and we all got good grades for it <laughs> for placing it in the first time. <laughs> We were evil at that point. Yeah, we, we were the kids that got beaten on at school, but there's so many of us that we found each other like really soon and or in, in the really beginning of our um, school, of the mid school or high school, basically. So we were the guys we were just hanging out at like one bunch. And we were the one with like LAN party every single weekend where our parents had to drive us and we had the heavy monitors carrying. Yeah, I remember a buddy of mine saying, like, oh, I bought myself a flat screen. Yeah, it was a flat screen, but it wasn't a flat monitor. It was just a flat like screen. Sony not a one. Yeah. yeah, Sony super flat. Yeah. yeah so so that, that thing was just like 30 kilos by itself. Yeah. The, like I said, the, the good old times. I remember my dad ringing me up at one point because I've been doing CAD for so long. And um, he rang me up and he went, I've, I've just been given um, it's a, a 21 inch IAMA um, CRT monitor, a CAD monitor. Do you want it? <laughs> yes, yes, I do want yeah. it. Can you bring it round in the van, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like you get the van. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that thing was horrific. I mean, you know, you, you, you think now, you know, 21 inch screens are. Ah, it's nothing, but that's a four to three aspect ratio, not your 21 inch wide screens. And the fact that it was a CRT as well, it was, a, it was about 600 mil deep. It was ridiculous. Well, I mean, it were the times Went where a monitor money. was as expensive as the PC. Oh, easy, yeah. Yeah. For definitely. the longest time, I had like a, I, I think I started with like a 13 inch. And um, for years, I played on a 17 because that was like the best price to view ratio on it yeah with that nice wonderful your ice watering after two hours of playing a video game <laughs> and you still played for three three days i mean it's just just enough else? gamma to just just warm the back of your eyes yeah <laughs> exactly it's like well i'm never getting cold so <laughs> yeah <sighs> fun times you, talk, oh, yeah. you talk about kind of internet at school. You know, when I was at school, the internet didn't exist. Well, right. technically, the internet did exist. The World Wide Web did not exist when yeah. I was in school. ARPANET we, was a thing, but Tim Berners-Lee hadn't been around enough to yeah. do anything useful with it yet. <laughs> we had 30 computers, and they were hooked up to one ESDN line, which is, was also shared with the <laughs> office of the school. So, yeah, probably basically non-existent. Mm. I think when I left school, I think I believe I might be wrong that there were six computers in the school. Two of them were in, were in the off, school office, and four of them were in the computer room, which was a, a maths room. And they were they were BBC Model Bs. Nice. Okay, those are already the small ones. I just wanted to say for a while, it's like a computer room would probably be a computer the size of a room. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't quite that. It wasn't kind of mainframe sort of size. Yeah, it was, they were kind of yeah, desk, hey, I, desk one sizable. Of the, at one of the companies I worked, there was a nice bench in the break room, and the bench was a one gigabyte hard drive, where people were sitting on it. And I'm like, oh, that's a neat idea. And the guy was just like, yeah, I remember when we put it there. Like we were supposed to throw it out, and it was so heavy that we decided we could we couldn't bother. We just put it into the break room and put some cushions on it and use it as a bench ever since then. <laughs> you couldn't do that on a micro SD card now, could you? Yeah. <laughs> I do like that. I do like that kind of. There's a, a photograph that turns up on the internet every now and again of uh, a, I think it's like a 512 megabyte hard drive in the 1960s being no, loaded in the side of a. It's a 128 meg hard drive really? being forklifted yeah. into the side of a building mm -hmm. um, next to a 128 gig micro SD card. Yeah, yep. that's the one. It's just like. It, 
I mean, the capabilities of what we've done. I mean, my first computer was the ZX81, which is one kilobyte of internal RAM. Mm. Couldn't do yep. much with it at one kilobyte. You know, you, you needed the memory pack, which took you to a full 16 kilobytes. <laughs> well, I mean, my, my dad ran a recording studio for years with a, uh, an Atari ST. And that, that had been upgraded to 2.2 megabytes of RAM. That was as much as you could physically fit in the thing. And that was that was floppy disk to load everything in. You had a big parallel yeah. port um, yeah. dongle in the back to run Cubase on it, and then you know like moved across from that to you know, a Pentium three Windows ninety eight custom build thing, you know, and then very rapidly put that in the bin and bought an Apple Mac. But you know, we won't talk about that. Always wanted, always <laughs> wanted the Atari ST. That was kind of that was kind of yeah, just before university. That was like one of the sort of dream machines to get. Mm. And when I, the, the, my first year of university, I shared a house. It was like an on-campus house, but I shared a house with uh, two guys. One, one was a musician, but the other guy was doing what's called the Tonmeister course, um, which mm-hmm. essentially is sound recording engineer. Yeah, and he, he had yeah. an Atari ST because mm-hmm. it had built-in MIDI control. Yep. He also had a uh, Sony Betamax recorder Nice. because that had digital sound mm-hmm. so he was able to do quite a lot of stuff with that that you, know, you couldn't do for the price himself Th- yeah that was before oh. cassettes right those um oh no you, oh, you're talking beta but beta was um beta max was video that was for yes. like the smaller yeah, VHS yeah. types it was yeah my, my grandmother tape. had that top, yep. top gun yep it those was smaller tape. It was the better it was the better tape yeah, but it was so expensive. I mean, they, they yeah. killed themselves by with the price. Oh, but how many times them. has Sony, Sony, and they've done that far too many times? It was Sony and Panasonic, wasn't it? Was the, the oh yeah, so, so Sonic. I think the last time I remember with the uh, Vario uh, or Vario um, notebooks, where they used mm-hmm. their own proprietary um, memory cards for it, and like oh, some special <laughs> kind of RAM. Yeah. It's, Sony memory okay. sticks. And stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. They, they, um, yeah. Sony and Panasonic have done done that thing quite a few times with, uh, with you know, mini disc was the other the particularly famous one that just licensed it to high hell and then never let anyone do anything useful with it. Yep, I still remember those um, HD CDs or DVDs, the red ones, um, where you would have like fifty fifty with the Blu Ray and then you would see it like shift, 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 and gone. <laughs> Yeah, remember it's, the, it's... the the uh, optical CDs? They were they, they were a, a CD that was basically in its own, like in the yeah. same way that you'd, you'd have like the jewel case. Yes, um, yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Would, think, which would slide out like it, same as mini disc, a gigabyte rather than the six fifty meg. You know, sort yeah. Of thing. I remember but when the CD called. came out with um, being able to get, I think, eight hundred megs on there, and I yeah, think that kind of made it so yeah. yeah. That yeah, really yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Like thinking about it, how how technology changed in that. Mm. I would love to say short amount of time, but now thinking about it, we're talking about the last twenty five years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Years. <laughs> it's more than twenty five years. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, but it's that nostalgic. It, it, it's mainly the nostalgic mm. because. I was dreaming about it, getting myself an old PC and just install like Windows 98 on it with an old CRTV monitor and just play some old classic games. And as romantic as it sounds, I think I would hate it after 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, if, if you even last that long. Or that'll just be once it's booted up. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's right, yeah. That's when you can log in into Windows. That's okay just, now. I didn't try a coffee back then, Windows I do now, so... Like... <laughs> yeah, just go and make myself a coffee. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that was one of the. I, I think in the old, I said the old days when I was a kid. <laughs> well, okay, in the old days, yeah. That it taught you patience. Back in my yeah, age, it's like when back you in the last of, age. Yeah, you kind of you got your, your your game on cassette, or even or even worse, you've had to type it in by hand. And mm-hmm. yeah, then hopefully not lose it. Somebody bumps the memory pack or the the power supply, or just the power supply overheats because that used to happen. Particularly, I think on the spectrums. Yep. 
-hmm. and it would just take yeah, absolutely ages to do it. It kind of it, it kind of taught you patience. <laughs> I think I think it's possibly a lost thing with computers because now we want everything instantly. The SSD, oh, oh man, it, yeah, it boots up in in fifteen but seconds. This is oh, the no, thing that's not fast with what ten. Because yeah. you've got you've got Moore's law, which is the the uh, number of discrete elements on any uh, package doubles every two years. It's the kind of the loose application of that law. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the corollary to that, which is the um, the fact that as the computing power doubles and hard drive space doubles, sort of every eighteen months, two years, you've also then got the games industry that and, and the software industry in general that makes use of that power. And then slows yep. everything back down. So yeah. that's why when you when you buy a new PC in five years time or whatever, it it still feel it, it feels super quick compared to what you've been used to. But what you've been used to is a PC that's five years old that was that quick when you first got it. But then all the software has slowed it back down, so that then you're not you know if you were to get each of those PCs along the way. They're not actually really getting that much faster because the software is just pulling them back down in terms of usage. Yeah, absolutely you know, true. Except it still except takes 10 nowadays. seconds to boot Word up. It still takes, you yeah. know. But it's actually like this is not true anymore for the last two years. <laughs> Only the prices are doubling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, if, if, for anyone who's following the tech news a little bit, they actually, uh, AMD just released a new graphic cards that is actually worse than the um, last generation of graphic cards, the RX um, 5080. They released like, what, seven years ago? Well, it's the same with NVIDIA, isn't it? They released the, the 2000 series cards and then the 3000 series cards, and now everyone's trying yeah. to get a 1000 series card again. Because they can't oh, get yeah, any because, of the other ones. Because the other ones, you, you can buy them anymore. I, I got yeah. a 380 in my computer because the day they released, I ordered it, and I never canceled the order, so it took half a year for it to arrive. But I actually got it as, at the M, uh, MSRP, yeah, for nice. like the seven hundred. <laughs> the same card now runs for fourteen hundred euros. That's just uh, insane. So that's why I say yep. it's like only prices are doubling right now, and with the chips and the chip manufacturers are now realizing that oh wait they're gonna pay whatever we're gonna ask for because so many <laughs> so many other uh, well, manufacturers went bankrupt and we're sure. the only one producing those chips. <laughs> They, but they're, they're not even able to produce them in the quantities that they are trying to. There's still that worldwide, worldwide component shortage that's hit just about everything. Yes, from... I'm just not sure because I work with measurement technology. And mm -hmm. if I look at that and the uh, different chips that are missing, I am not sure how much is really... Let's say I don't think they're working as hard on getting that shortage solved as they could. <laughs> Because they're, they're, they're okay. calling up, like, the manufacturer of the chips went up in prices. Like, mm. every, every all in the industry, all the prices you see right now that are going up is mainly because the suppliers also raised their prices. So it's just oh, one, yeah. one starts and it goes through the whole thing. So well, our I mean, customers are not even shocked yeah. anymore. Yeah, We have customers that, they, that go like, what, a 5% five, 5 price increase? Oh, yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> We're like... Oh, we can make it ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's but, it's, it's, it's it's chaotic. A marketing strategy: keep raising your price till nobody buys it, and then just drop it down a bit. Yeah, but this is one of the issues with working. Um, I don't know if anyone knows, but I'm, I'm working for a Japanese company, and the mentality is a completely different one from the uh, like everyone in Europe or let's put the, the Western. We, um, mm -hmm. It is normal for Western companies to increase their prices like two to three percent every year or every other year to just with inflation. everything that's happening. Yeah, inflation and everything that's happening. Japanese don't do that. And this mm -hmm. is like a whole thing over Japan. They're actually going to try to keep a price as long and stable as possible. And if they can't anymore, then there's a price increase. But that price increase is like 15 to 20 percent. Now I'm on the other side. I have the absolute fun on telling that to my customers. Mm. Remember how you were happy about it, not getting a price <laughs> increase for the last five years? Well, here's a 20% one, <laughs> which is not is, happening, thankfully. Like we, There is the other end of that with Japanese companies is that they also don't reduce their prices when the um, manufacturer at scale tends mm -hmm. to reduce them. 
So you look at things like um, Japanese games industry, Nintendo being a perfect example there of oh, yeah. still still having a game that was released five six years ago at the same retail price and the yes, same price for the success, digital version successful as it was it. when it came out. <laughs> they're they're successful with it though. The, yeah, this they is are, because yeah. they never went with the tech. Like they didn't go down the technology road. They're coming from um, Nintendo used to make board games. Yeah, and they are coming from that kind of perspective of where they, they how to what's the best way to explain that? Where the way of the game is important. I can now get an N sixty four game or a Super Nintendo game or even a, like I got myself an NES, and there are still games on there that are even with the graphics are just so much fun to play. Yeah, and that's what absolutely. they make well. It's not a blockbuster where everything explodes and you're done after twenty hours, but the next game is exactly the same thing. Nintendo, if you get a game, it's basically you sit there and you can play that game over and over again. Of course, not every game, but the ones that are directly made by Nintendo are that good. Yeah, usually. agreed. Yeah, there's there's still um, a handful of games that I made my daughter go back to play all the time on the SNES. Yep. And it, they're just, you know, the games from the mid-90s that are games I grew up with that I still go back and enjoy the shit out of. Yep. That is the... Those is that because they're things. games that you can play together? Do you think? Do you think that's um, part of it? Not necessarily, because not... some of them are yeah. like single player games that, you know, I, I might play through and she'll sit and watch, or then she'll play through and I'll sit and watch, you know, and things like that that are, they're just really, really, really well made games. Mm -hmm. you know, they're and they're, they're the fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it used to be the one. I mean, you see it on the commercials on the old Game Boy, where one plays the like one kid plays with the Game Boy, and you got like four like looking, over, looking his over his shoulder and yeah, yeah. And, and watching it. <laughs> but it was exactly how it was. Those mm -hmm. those were expensive, and usually one or two friends would have one, and or maybe more, but the parents would take it away because the grades are bad. And then you went <laughs> over to a buddy's place and he was play playing the game. And if you were smart before you even showed your parents your grade, you already took your favorite Game Boy game out of the Game Boy and put like another one in. So if they take it away, at least you have the game and can go over to your buddy's house with it. <laughs> yeah. And the same with the Super Nintendo or NES. Like one kid would play and you would pass around the controller and everybody would sit mm -hmm. around and watch them because the games were even if you're not playing them, everybody was just still excited about it. And the funny thing is, I still feel that way. And it is, we had friends over um, a couple, it was before my vacation, I think November or December when I got that. And I just hooked up the NES to try it out. And my wife would come in and she would sit on the bed like next to me and just watch <laughs> watch me like trying out the games, play it. And watching sprites jump around on the screen. <laughs> exactly. But it has the exact same feeling like it has back then, like you can still do it today. Huh? And this is something Nintendo mastered. So I don't, I never really, um, how do you say that? They are a completely different beast than a lot of the other manufacturers when it comes to that. Oh, absolutely. Like you say, I mean, they've been around since what, late 1800s, um, doing board games and playing cards and things like that. So, so then. You know, Almost went bankrupt, to... then started yeah. with the NES and Game Boy. I think the, um, no, NES and then I think uh, Super Nintendo or Famicom, I believe is the name in the US, and yeah. um, Game Boy were supposedly, I think, at the same time designed, or was it still NES? Uh, NES was late 80s, um, Super Nintendo. So it was, it was the same time as the Game were... Boy then, yeah. Yeah, so it's NES, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, Game Boy Color, and N sixty four were very very close. Um, I I saved money up with my brother, and we together bought the N sixty four. We pre ordered it, and there were delivery issues, and I think they arrived like three or four months late. So we were okay. just wait and the games were already out so we already bought Zelda Ocarina of Time we hold it in our hands and we didn't have the console we were waiting for it <laughs> going by at the toy store every other day I think when those finally arrived the lady at the counter was just 
so happy more than us. <laughs> Just not see you two again. <laughs> exactly. Every day after school, taking turns. Uh-huh. Yep. And that then there's the Wii. Tough. The only console. The only console I've ever had. The Wii. The we only bought it for our I've kids. Never owned. They were, uh, I've never had a console of my own. We bought the kids. My kids a, a Wii. Oh crikey! Probably ten years ago. Mm. Um, yep. And they, yeah, they enjoyed playing that, particularly like the kind of yeah, Mario Kart and the various kind of sport the sort of yeah. sport ones you know like yep. olympics and mountain biking that was quite a popular one with us as a sort of family kind of going downhill mountain biking yep <laughs> and also a lot of those games are wonderful drinking games at a party <laughs> make sure <laughs> you wear your wrist you. strap <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> Well, that was the big thing, wasn't it? When when we bowling became a thing, and that was the tennis, tennis and bowling, and it was um, one of the, the the main issues at the time was people embedding the Wiimotes into the flat screen TVs. Yep, I think there was a whole new business. It's just, I can imagine like some guy at LG standing there, and it's like, why are our sales going up thirty <laughs> percent? <laughs> Why do we get so many repairs with controllers still stuck in the screen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And kids getting hit over the head, of course, because then adults using the thing, getting a little bit over exuberant and uh, tennising their child in the face accidentally. <laughs> yep. I think we managed to survive all of those. I think we kind of had been enough because we were in the first wave. So we kind of had heard enough stories. <laughs> I always made sure that you say that there's enough the of a controllers gap in and the nunchucks always had yeah. the kind of <laughs> straps on and I think we had a couple of near misses but yeah, uh, people learn no. pretty fast and then yeah. they were safe for a couple of years and then VR came around yeah I saw a video clip on Reddit before that was um, they basically cleared their room out a little bit to, to uh, you know kind of make enough space to VR properly. And um, it was obviously, you know, they'd, they'd put the VR unit on their mum to just, you go and have fun in the middle of that big room. And, it, you know, it must have been, there must have been, I don't know, probably 10 foot either side of her. You know, a good, a good sort of three metres maybe either side. Yeah. Um, and she's stood in the middle, VR on, absolutely going for it loving it and then obviously just reached that point where it's that that tipping point where you forget that it's a game complete immersion and then just fell over backwards straight into the wall (laughs) yeah I've seen a lot of people doing that uh, roller coaster demo where there's like people standing for it and I think that's just evil yep because if your brain is not used to VR like I still remember how trippy that was yeah, I mean, we um, when my brother got his uh, PlayStation VR, um, he'd done the whole thing with the chair and got the um, racing wheel and mm-hmm. the pedals and everything set up. So we'd gone up to visit my brother, and after me and him had had a, a bit of a race in it and stuff, we were like, right, mum, in you get, headset on, crack on, we'll stick you in a, in a Lamborghini Aventador, <laughs> off, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> and we ended up, it got to the point where um, I had to stand on one side and my brother had to stand on the other just for the amount of times that mum would lean over and I could back oh, the corner just, or yeah. stuff like that. and she fell out the chair a couple of times we had to catch her and kind of you know sit her back in she just a total <laughs> complete immersion just blew her mind yeah. that doesn't, doesn't take much no it did a massive massive smile on her face though while screaming at us <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. I think if money was no object, I'd, I'd certainly love to kind of do one of those kind of, right, let's stick a, a frame of a racing car on a, some hydraulic lifts. And so yep. you've got proper controls. You've got, you actually feel like you're in it and maybe kind of surround screen if it's not VR. And yeah. Or similarly with a plane. I remember reading yeah. an article years ago. Uh, it's got to be about 15 years ago about a guy who, um, 
he'd bought I think it was at auction but somehow or other he got the, the the nose and by nose I mean the kind of the cockpit forwards mm. of a 737 I think it was <laughs> and this is in the States and he, he installed it in his garage with I, I think he put project I think he had projectors so he had basically 180 degree projected <laughs> screens outside nice. the cockpit and basically played MS Flight. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, there's a guy that built his own racing simulator and um, he using the item like the aluminum profiles, construction profiles, would actually service motors and programs them. Mm -hmm. And he's doing the notch life, and he does it in a racing seat, and he's strapped into the racing seat because that thing vibrates that bad with like a huge white screen, and that thing is so insane. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. I think he's a race driver though, so he uses it for <laughs> training. Yeah, but, a, uh, yeah. A friend of mine does like he, he um he was racing in brscc um in a boxster and mm -hmm. he would do uh he would use project cars to train um on tracks that he couldn't easily yeah. go and you know if it was 150 miles away he wasn't going to be able to go and you know nip up there one weekend with the with the car to go and do some training so he'd he'd set a boxster up very similar to his setup and then he'd go and do you know a weekend's worth of driving on on project cars with his also a lot cheaper if you, Hell cheaper, <laughs> you yeah. get thrown yeah. out of the track for example <laughs> yeah a few yeah. years ago I've, I've talked about sort of simulators uh oh it's got to be correct it's got to be close to 10 years ago now i had the opportunity to visit uh british aerospace BAE uh, facility. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. So BAE um, facility. Uh, it's part of a kind of it was a let's get science and technology teachers in and, and talk to them about opportunities, etc. Is that over in Farnborough? No, no. Um, uh, Rochester. Mm. We worked on that recently. They had. Um, but a part of the facility there was one, one of the things they do is they manufacture there the helmets used for the Eurofighter Typhoon. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Which is which is very interesting. There's some interesting technology there, and as part of that, they have a Typhoon simulator. Now it's not a full blown. You you've, you've got a cockpit, but it doesn't look like it from the outside. So you've got a, the, the seat. And you've got essentially a big screen. You don't have the kind of uh, all the kind of heads up display. That you, actually, no, there was partial heads up display, okay. but it wasn't kind. Of, you were enclosed, so essentially it was this. You, you climb in over the side of this thing, and it, it's all open. And there's this big screen in front, and you get this opportunity to kind of have a go at flying a typhoon, which nice. is is fun. Um, luckily, there's not too much kind of sort of uh, feedback. There's a little bit of haptic feedback <laughs> on the controller, but not too much because I managed to do a, a water-based landing somewhere off the coast of Wales. Um, which... Yeah, an, an uncontrolled descent, perhaps. <laughs> there, there's so much redundancy built into yeah. those aircraft. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I used to work um, at BAE Systems up in. I worked on the, the Wharton Aerodrome and the Salisbury Aerodrome, and then worked for them um, in Chorley as well. Um, but yeah, the, the the Salisbury Aerodrome is where they do a lot of the manufacturing for things like the fuselages and stuff like that, and wings and all that fun stuff. And then it was like final assembly and testing at the Wharton Aerodrome. So seeing like you know a fleet of twelve typhoons taking off, and then seeing every single car in the car park going absolutely haywire with their alarm systems, you always mm. knew when there was you know it's like oh rapid testing, and off, off they go, and then yep. just for the next ten minutes it's just alarms going mental. We um, had it not too long ago here, probably about two three months ago. 
during like late autumn time, springtime, no autumn, autumn, so late summer, early autumn, there were some um, jets going through the sound barrier here. And there were alarms going off and people thought there was an explosion. So people calling 911 because you could hear like it was two of them. So mm -hmm. it really sounded like an explosion. All the windows were shaking in here. And we found out it was probably like 30 or 40 kilometers away where that happened. So I don't even want to know how it was directly. <laughs> and they, they yeah. did it like over Stuttgart, which is not the smallest city. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yep. <laughs> there were some pilots that probably had some explaining to do. <laughs> be interesting to know what they were in as well. The um, the latest uh, kind of fun of games is the um, F thirty five Lightning two, which is the JSF. It's a uh, joint project, a joint venture between Lockheed Martin BAE Systems and a handful of others. Um, I'm pretty certain Germany and Spain and France are also involved. That, that's a really, really interesting one. The only thing that tells me is that it's going to be way too expensive for technology from the 70s, probably. <laughs> it, well, it, the, the Typhoon and the um, the Lightning 2, they they are completely fly-by-wire. There's, there's like... Yeah. It, it, the, there's so much redundancy built into all of them. You know, the, the, the pilots could both pass out and they just remote drive them back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, think, thing. I think the Typhoon's got some like 11 computers, yeah. all separate. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, the independent redundancy. Well, the, the the Typhoon, I'm not sure if you're aware, Andy, but the, the Typhoon is aerodynamically unstable. It yeah. can't glide. Yeah, um, absolutely. If if it's not being actively managed, it just falls out the sky. Yeah. Oh, fun. Yeah. It, it's a really odd shape if you've not seen it. it. It's got these like weird like ear flaps at the front and everything. It's They're phenomenal to see in action as well. They absolutely yeah. are. It's that kind of, especially with that, that vectored thrust capability. And for, yeah. first time I saw vectored thrust in kind of, you know, not sort of, yeah, in, in live as opposed to kind of on video or anything, would have been so about. That's where you see a jet skidding in the air. Yeah, well, sideways, doing a power it was, it was 90, it, I think it was something like 93. Mm -hmm. I was at the open day at RAS in Athens. And it was the. Mig twenty five or Mig twenty six. It was the it was the flanker, and do, no, it was first, I believe it was the first time that the flanker had been seen in the UK. Okay. And it came in, it came in across the on the runway, at about hundred feet, so thirty meters above the sort of above the deck. It it flew along the runway. And it got to the end of the runway, and it stood on end flipped over, flew back the way it had come. And ah, it didn't, go, it didn't go above 200 feet. Mm -hmm. Did not go above 200 feet at any point. Literally, mm -hmm. the, the, the exhaust stayed at 100 feet. The whole thing just kind of stood on end. There was a slight rise as it dipped back and flew back the other way. And I'll tell you what, the crowd was stunned because no, no one had seen that you know, close up. Yeah, I mean, the thing was... Look, I mean, I was... 200 feet away from it 250 feet maximum or minimum away from it and yeah, just absolutely phenomenal and the first time I saw a, a, the Eurofighter kind of in the wild I actually thought it was the flanker to start with because I, the, at the point I saw it I was basically seeing it going away from me at an angle but it shouldn't really have been able to fly yeah it's like defying <laughs> the rules of physics <laughs> yeah uh, um, and I didn't try to give like shit to the airplane. It's just whenever the German military decides to invest money in something, people here usually get really cautious. They, not not the best history of buying stuff that actually works afterwards. <laughs> they're, they're really good sinking massive amount of money in stuff that either the deal gets cancelled or that stuff never gets produced. I, th I think that's fairly general to most Militaries, Most, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, been a few cases of it in the UK. Yeah. More than a few. Yeah, I mean, it was funny actually. We were talking about like that, um, that lightning too, because that that had loads and loads and loads of problems. And because we were working 
um because it was it's a massive you know joint venture between a handful of different countries so we had this uh it was a presentation from one of the reps at lockheed um i think whichever the american company was that was involved but we we all have to come here i think so we all had to sit there and, and go through this briefing and it was it's what they call it an itar briefing and it's talking about you know you uh, you know, it, it, we we already had to have uh, SC level clearance to be there and work there, so that's UK secret and NATO secret level. Um, but then we had to go through this additional briefing uh, for the the ITAR briefing for um, dealing with any of the the sheds where they were doing anything with the Lightning Two and um, the, the Joint Strike Fighter, they called it, didn't they? So this, this was, you know, a full on presentation and briefing of, you know, thou shalt not speak about this thing to anyone. Thou shalt not know of its existence. And we, you know, sort of finished this briefing. We're like, bloody hell, this must be super, you know, super secret. Like, it's crazy that they're trusting us with this level of thing. Let's just have a look, see what's on Wikipedia. And there's the full specs of the plane on, on Wikipedia. <laughs> and then like a couple of months later, there was, you know, someone had apparently leaked the specs of the uh, leaked uh, a load of the software and code in the US <laughs> you know, it's just like I, I thought we weren't allowed to speak of this thing <laughs> you know? yep but yeah it's uh, fun yep oh that, that yeah, and, and more, yeah that's more, more than one intelligence things. agency have full copies of the specs <laughs> yeah. Outside of the countries that are actually doing it, yeah. Oh yes, yeah. And <laughs> military like... military companies are always fun. Um, back when I used to live in the US, I worked for uh, Trump, the laser cutting manufacturer, or laser cutting machines, and I had a job at a while well, they're making loading system for bombers, and they had one of the lasers there, so I did service on the laser. And they were doing all kinds of stuff. They were contracted by the U.S. military, so there were safety regulations. So many of them. Till to, you're actually in the plan. The funny thing about it is, you know who owned the company? It was an Iranian owner. <laughs> so half of the guys there were like talking English with a pretty heavy accent <laughs> because right. it was a pretty small company. It was not like that building after building but they were just contracted by the u.s military ring i'm like yeah that's kind of fucked up <laughs> <laughs> especially that i mean that was during bush that time so i was just like yeah that, that's that's weird conflict of interest wonder, there, but just... <laughs> yeah exactly like slight side of them yeah slight slight M might be a slight issue <laughs> yeah Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly if stuff like that happens. <laughs> should, we, should we do introductions? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Nearly an hour in, yeah, I suppose we might as well. I mean, we, we, we are roughly two thirds focused tonight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, one, th one here. third of two thirds focused, so that would be one sixth. One sixth focused? Wait, no. two ninths? <laughs> It's like four fifth, uh, fifth, six. Yeah, yeah two ninths. Yeah, two ninths. <laughs> no more focus than usual. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, introduction. That would be me, right? If you want yeah. to. If you want. There's no, there's no we know requirement you, to. <laughs> we know you're called Jan. That's close enough. Exactly. <laughs> One of that. Weird maker bunch. <laughs> you're not red, and you're not you... the other one, so you must be young. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. What, what do you What do you guys want to know? Seriously, it's just a, as a hobby, yeah, just part of the maker community. Um, doing YouTube, and Instagram for fun. Uh, sometimes I even upload a video. I might even upload one this year again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting. As well. I'm getting strangely close to the level of um, taking Steve as an example. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think it's been over half a year since I uploaded the last video. I've done a lot of projects, I just didn't film them. Um, so it started. I've been on YouTube and 
recording different videos for probably over nine years with breaks in between. And um, I used to be in the whole miniature painting scene. So basically got that even here. I just recently started painting Warhammer figures again. Nice. And um, so I've, I've been consuming YouTube for a long time. So that's when I started with at one point decided that I wanted do um, YouTube videos myself and um, <laughs> there's a reason I'm not telling anyone my first channel that I had back then because I think there's still some videos online <laughs> even I haven't uploaded in probably seven or eight years so that, that was the, the beginning I wouldn't say beginning time of YouTube but the beginning time of like those hobby videos mm -hmm. so we're talking unedited uncolorized com yeah, completely unedited half an hour 45 minutes of me just slapping paint on a miniature i tried to watch one of those videos the other day and i was just like yeah no can't, can't do it <laughs> you can't watch it <laughs> yeah no so this is where i started um at one point i got into that whole um make community um but i think i talked about that a couple of times ago so uh it really started for me going to maker central in 219. so this is where i met most of you guys at least you, Andy, I think, Jamie, I think we had a talk there. Not exactly sure at that point. I know yeah, in the Hangout I've... afterwards, but... I think we definitely must have. I'm trying to think who, who else we would have been chatting with at the time. Well, so, the... I think for me, there were so many people there. Yeah. I mean, I, there, there's so many people came up to me that I was like, saying, hi, hello. And it's like, I'm going... Uh, <laughs> yeah. There was sometimes on new faces, sometimes I didn't, and, it, it, there were, and there were so many people that kind of I I certainly probably only said hello to about half the people that I kind of, so many people kind of going, I know them, I know them, I know them, and, and there were the kind of you know, some of the big names you kind of think, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to go up to big name person, hmm. but they were kind of you know all the kind of uh, I met a previous previous guest on the show, Dan Wood, uh, Maker Geek. Yeah, I saw him several times. I thought, I'm going to talk to him. But he was walking around with his wife, and I was like, I, I kind of didn't feel always like I could just go and go, hello, there is... and walk up to people. I'm a name that you've seen on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah. I am. I barely remember what happened at Maker Central at that time. <laughs> like, it, it was, for me, it was such a flash because... Um, Most I started... people have been a victim of uh, Dr. Maltese bruise. No, 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 that was that, that that wasn't even it because um I'm one of those you know why I lived in the US for four and a half years? Because I got thrown out of Germany for not liking beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I went I, for his coffee anyway, so <laughs> I hope he brings cider the next time. The um, uh no the, the the thing about it is is for me I think what was the first one? One of the first ones I've seen was uh definitely uh red. From his videos i stumbled over i think the first one i stumbled over was actually brad um because it was at the beginning where he did the whole thing with his i think he was making a Zelda bow or something and i just love that and that was the first idea of me like oh i want to make stuff like that and there's not there's no shame in being completely nerdy about it i can actually do whatever i want because i've okay. seen woodworking videos and stuff like that before i used to do a lot of not restoration, but basically um, stuff around the house or the apartments I lived in in the US. I fixed a lot of stuff myself. So I've been looking for stuff like that all the time. So I've seen some of the maker videos. I've probably even seen some Diresta videos, but mm -hmm. I've never put, I, I didn't know that something like the maker community existed. For me, it was just guides and tutorials on the internet. So when I with Brad, it started like going down that rabbit hole. Then I found Red, uh, then the whole full with tool thing. And from there, of course, it's like once you open that door, it's just everything. Then I had a question about it and I just left a comment and I thought it's like, well, they're never going to answer anyway. Suddenly I had a message <laughs> and I got an answer to my questions. I was like, oh, wow, that is crazy. So I started writing with the people and it just snowballed from there. And me being at Maker Central was the doors opened, I walked in, and I saw those people that I basically followed every single week, the videos that I was just like, 
I'm not it's starstruck. You. I used to be a trainee. I, yeah, I, I used to give classes in front of 20, 30 people, like engineers. I, I'm not shy in any means. I was standing there. I could not get out a word. For, for the first half an hour, I was basically sneaking around the booth where like <laughs> Red and Alan were working and just like, oh, what should I do? What should I do? And then at one point, I just went up and said hi and started a conversation. And back in the evening then when everybody was meeting up at the Marriott, that was where I was shy again. Like I was in there and everybody was compacted in that bar. And I was just like, I'm here all, like I flew there on my own. I just, I told my wife, it's like, I'm going to make her hang out. She's like, you, you what? <laughs> I, yeah, I'm going to be back in three days. <laughs> so I hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I uh, flew over there. I was completely by myself. Not anyone that didn't know anyone uh, standing in a bar. And I was I just wanted to grab one drink and then sneak out again and go back to the hotel. And that's actually eight where... hours later. Pretty much that's what happened because uh, who actually caught me on my way out was Sharon. And Sharon is like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I was just about to leave. And she's like, yeah, you're not leaving. You're one of us now. And she just pulled me over to the table where like Elle and all the others like, and I think this is where you were also sitting, Andy. It's like in front of the bar when you walk up the stairs, like just on the right side, there was that round table yeah. because I still remember that like the first day. And then it basically happened. It was, I think, six or seven hours later middle of the night yeah me trying to find a way back slightly drunk to my hotel because the <laughs> monorail wasn't driving anymore and uh sidewalks are probably not invented in birmingham i don't know so <laughs> just walk on the street through the field back to the hotel over there yeah yeah pretty much that was interesting but yeah that's how it all started and um ever since then it's like <laughs> no you guys not getting rid of me anymore <laughs> Yeah. No matter how hard we try. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no spoilers, no nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've, I mean, of course, we've, you know, we've touched on general nerdery type stuff, but we, we obviously haven't touched on your love for the Harry Potter genre. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, the spoilers thereof. No, I, I I read I read all the books, I watched all the movies, but it's been years. And I mentioned on the two thirds, I made the mistake on mentioning two things. First, that I'm reading the Harry Potter books again, and second of all, uh, that I hate spoilers. Um, I mean, like like the good friends that we are, we just had to encourage you and help save you some time and just bastards. fill in some of the gaps and exactly. <laughs> getting different messages and uh, from uh, with different spoilers and none of them are the same so it's it's like oh, ever over every single book it's just like yeah hey, fun it's fact, systemic I have and not... coordinated attack i think this was <laughs> i i have not continued reading that book ever since then i just put it aside it's like well now i know what happened <laughs> yeah i mean we, we could just save you some time and just fill in all the details for you Exactly. Hey, Jamie, any shows you're watching at the moment? Or... <laughs> no, not a chance. Not, not yeah. going to tell you anything. <laughs> yeah. I, to I told you guys earlier that I already got uh, back on Rasmus, at least, <laughs> yeah. and read a little bit. So I hope he's having fun with that DC show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you no, can't I get Steve back because Steve doesn't watch anything, you know, that, that hasn't already been out for 20 years anyway. You know, so... Also, he's going to forget like two hours later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I can, but, I, I but, can write him. It's just not going to do anything. It's like, oh, yeah, really? You, you, oh, yeah. Must have forgot <laughs> about it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I Dan remember Brent, that last yeah, week. Dan, it's like, ding, message comes up. It's like, oh, Steve's writing me. It's been a long time. I wonder what he's up to. Hey, by the way. <laughs> 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 Fucker. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was in a traffic jam and the people right next to me probably thought it's like, oh my, that guy is losing it. He's not used to traffic jams anymore because I'm sitting in my car. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. I think it must have only been maybe five or ten minutes from, from when Steve sent you that message. And then he Oh and then you was like Jamie. I was like, Oh, maybe he has something more to write me about fusion and I open it up and I'm just like 
Yeah, because you're the bastard. Steve, Steve <laughs> sent you that message, then sent us a screenshot, and then we all both start laughing. The, the, the chat with um, like me and Andy and Red in it and so on. Yeah. And, but, uh, but he was not the first one. I, that morning I received... <laughs> I, I have to check it later, but I have, I've received more. And like I said, I told my buddies about it, like over oh, WhatsApp and in, in my group of my friends. And it's like, can you believe those fuckers? They just spoiled Harry Potter for me, like completely <laughs> after me, like reading it again after waiting so many years. And the answer just was like, oh, did they tell you that? Did they tell you this? And I'm just like, <laughs> ah, I never learn. I just never learn. <laughs> Oh yeah, Stefan. So yeah, now I'm reading a different book, and no, I'm not gonna tell you what kind of book it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, you want good reads? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so oh yeah, that's true. Next week. <laughs> yeah. The, the, no, the, the worst. The worst thing that could basically happen is that somebody could, uh, would already have his hands on Doors of Stone from Patrick Rothfuss. I think if that book comes out, I might have to just do a digital detox and just put my cell phone away for a couple of months to wait that that yeah. one comes out. <laughs> because every single book of his, I basically took, I started reading and I read through the night. But mm-hmm. usually it's so much to read that you can't just do it in one night. You have to stay up for a while to read those. Yeah, I remember um, when I think it must have been which one? Which was it? The, there was sixth book, Harry Potter book, um, Half Blood Prince. Mm-hmm. When that came out, yeah. um, a mate of mine was in the queue when Waterstones opened at midnight, and then she texted me before I woke up for work. Just said, oh my god, that, that book was brilliant. And she'd literally just read straight from about 10 past 12 uh, until she finished the book at about yep. half six, quarter seven, something like that. That mm-hmm. was quite a that chunky was... one as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That was one hell of an achievement. Prisoner of Azkaban was the first book that I kind of read through the night as an adult mm-hmm. and I was I mean I can't remember I was late yeah. 20s early 30s when that came out and it was mm-hmm. a case of it, it was a school night as well I'd kind of got so far I'd kind of yeah sort of bedtime yeah. 11 o'clock half past 11 something like that I was just like uh, Harry, I Harry need to Potter know what's going to happen it was like yeah. 3 o'clock I finished uh, Harry Potter was one of those books I don't think after that I had like that kind of fun to read a book again till um, Name of the Wind from Patrick Rothfuss. And that was a book I started three times. And every single time I started reading it, um, I wouldn't get over the first sentence basically. Well, I would start reading in the evening to tire, just lay it aside, I'd probably read like the first three pages. And after that, Boy, one evening I got over page four or five, and the next thing I remember is that my alarm clock is going off, and I'm halfway through the book, and I have to go to work, and I didn't sleep for shit. <laughs> and that's why I love and hate Patrick Rothfuss so bad because he came out with the first book, then with the second book, and I think it's been six or seven years when people have been waiting on the third book of the trilogy. And he just completely ruined reading for me because he is writing, in my opinion, he's such a good writer and it's so much fun to read his books and they suck you in to that world. And after that, every other book I just t- took and I put aside, it's like, nah, it's just not as, nah, it's not as good. <laughs> I don't think I've ever read any of his. Have you have not no. read them? No. So many, there's there's, there's different so many books. books. That's, 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 that's my the problem. problem. Yeah. yeah, there's um three. He came out with three books, which is Name of the Wind. Uh, the second one is oh, Mighty Mind's Red. 
at least one of them. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 the, the name of the second one slipped my mind. And then there's this uh, slow regard of silent things, which is like a short story of one of the characters in there, like a small book, which is also beautiful written though. Hmm. Let me tell you when you uh, tell me when you start reading those books, so I can spoil them for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make like a, I draw together like the best scenes inside the book. <laughs> I'm not going to say it now because we're live and I don't want to <laughs> wise man's fear from Rasmus. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Name of the wind and wise man's fear. I can't know. Yeah. Rasmus isn't meant to put in useful information. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's simply a spoiler. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil it because I, I in particular only hate you guys at the moment so i'm not like, i'm not gonna make like everyone watching it my enemy you don't know, upset the, the audience just us two <laughs> yeah. steve does no, say hi by the way hi steve <laughs> bastard <laughs> i do not have the chat open so i'm, I'm not or else i'm gonna oh no no this, it, this was in uh in whatsapp he's I just okay. sent him a, a screenshot of uh, of our chat. So he's yeah. <laughs> like, "Hi, Jan." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got. I don't read as much as I used to. I mean, as a, as, as a teenager, mm -hmm. I would I'd be reading five, six proper sized books a week. Maybe kind of less if it was really chunky ones. Yeah. Um, I was like, uh, "What was it?" James Clavell's Ninja Samurai, Japanese based Shogun. It was okay. Japanese based. Yeah, I mean that was a that was a chunky book. I think that took me just over a week to read. Um, but apart from that, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That was one week to read the three of those. Although that was a holiday week. That was one of yeah. I, I, used to, I mean, I used to read stacks, but then yes, yeah, as, as a and even at university, I read a lot, and it, yeah, we'd swap books around between us, kind of yeah, people we were sharing houses with, and mm. yeah, you got introduced to kind of new stuff from mm. that. But I, I would, I would like to say it's anymore. time, like not having time, but it's not true because I sit there in the evening watching YouTube videos for for hours, yeah. so it's a bad excuse for it. Um, it's I think that the term of concentrating on it. I used to read a lot when I was in the US because I was a service technician and I had four to six flights a week. Mm -hmm. So I would spend three or four hours on the plane between job assignments, just all through the country, traveling everywhere. And also I was staying, I was living in hotels most of the time. So there was nothing else to do. I read all Terry Pratchett Discworld novels within half a year, like every single one. I would, and because they would sell them at every airport. So I would go yeah, into those mobile yeah. Barnes and Nobles at the airport and just take a book. And the old one I would like throw in my bag and at home I would take them out. And after a while I had like a carton filled with all of the the books from him. And this is one of the, the stuff that I regret is coming back from the US. I had to get rid of the books and nobody wanted them because no one of my friends was reading books and I had to throw them out. I was trying to give them away for free and there was no one like I put him on Craigslist for free. There was no one that wanted those books. Yeah. And everyone who's saying, into them has already got them and everyone who's not heard of them is not going to go for it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I had to get rid of them and it broke my heart and then I got back here and now you see it. I got my wife into reading it and now it's slowly starting to <laughs> fill up again. I got her a reading like first when we started dating like shortly after I came back I met my wife and we started um, dating and I've only watched movies in English because I can't watch them in Germany anymore like I can't watch dub movies <laughs> it's just like I can't do it and um, so she started and now she's only watching movies in English she's reading English books and she reads a ton like she has an unread um, bookcase next to the bed and we have one wall in our living room which is just books and probably 20 books are mine and the rest of the 200 are hers that are in there yeah she goes through books she's just like well that one's done next one 
So every time I walk in, I see her with another book. And it's like, are you reading four books at the same time? She's like, no, I'm done with them. <laughs> it's just, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, that's why recently I started picking up books again and started reading again. And there's a big list. And good thing is we have the same taste in books. So she also reads a lot of fantasy novels. That's so that makes it really easy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to sort of go in fits and starts. I'll I'll either, you know, I'll spend six months just like avidly reading, mm -hmm. and then just nothing for a few months. Um, but I think because if if I get one that I'm really into, I, I'll just I'll be super entrenched in it. And I've, I've had a few books recently that have been like a, a collection. I, I tend to read them, you know, Kindle app, mm -hmm. and um, I'll, I'll the ones I've read recently have been. Like an anthology where they've, you know, they've, they've just lumped all of them together in the one Kindle file, basically. Yep. Um, but w one of the authors uh, has a habit of going back through. So, like, they'll release, you know, five books over the course of a few years, and then they'll go back and like re-edit some and turn it into into the one collection. Okay. You know, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I love those collections. Sort of, I yeah, you just start reading. You just work your way through the entire story because it's been re-edited into one. Yeah, I'm not sure if it know, was fourteen hundred page lump. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was Harry Potter or one of the other books where I actually um, I ordered the book and I also bought it on Kindle. So I started reading it on Kindle, and then when the paperback arrived, I continued with the paperback or switched in between the two. And I did that for a lot of books. And also there were some deals in the US where you could order a book and you would also get the Kindle and the normal one as a mm -hmm. combo. So basically you buy the hard paper and you only buy one or two dollars more and you also get the Kindle version of it. So that was great. Yeah, that was, yeah, now these days I'm really trying to read more because I feel like watching I'm I'm I don't watch a lot of series on TV or I don't watch TV at all but going over Netflix and Prime there's not a lot of TV shows I watch I think Witcher is one of them and even there I yeah that let's leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> no 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 <laughs> and the, um That's I, I miss I miss the kind of fantasy <laughs> while reading this like the whole thing of imagining the world and drawing your own picture about it. And that's something I learned by reading Harry Potter again. I had did not have a single reference to the movies. Like I did not think about the movies once while reading those books, but I remembered how it was when I read those books all those years ago yeah. and the imagination I had, like this is coming back. And this is what ignited the spark of fun for me again to start reading books again. So uh, I'm not just planning on reading new books that I haven't read, but I also want to like pick out some old classical ones. I want to re, I want to read again the Lord of the Rings. I still yeah. got the it's like a green version, like the really old one from like the seventies, like mm -hmm. thin parchment paper, the, the, the green with the gold inlays, is it? Exactly, yeah. And I want to read that again because that those were the ones I got from my dad. That was his. And the first ones I read, and I think I was 12 or 13 years old at that time. That was the first time when I read Lord of the Rings. Rasmus is back. Oh, no. I, I find there's some books I can read again and again, but other books I can't. Mm -hmm. So for me, I can read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy over yep. and over and over and over again without any worries at all. Um, not fiction, but Touching the Void by Joe Simpson, which is an amazing book. I can read that over and over and over again without any worries as well. But I often find other books I just can't. So I really like um, the Jack Reacher novels by Lee Child. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's only a couple of times that I've managed to, because yes, sometimes you kind of go, I get them from the library and kind of pick one up and think, have I read that? Can't really quite remember. And you start reading it and you think, yeah, no, I've read this one. I have, yep. uh, quite often, I'll kind of go, nah, I'll just I'll, I'll stop. It's very rare f f for uh, Jack Reacher that I'll kind of go, yeah, actually, I'm going to carry on reading that one again. Okay. A, a lot of books, I just I just can't read them a second time. 
Mm. Might might depend on the story of them. There are books that are yeah. really exciting to read and that have a great story, uh, but after you're done, you're done with the book because it's told its story. And then there are other ones that are really good in world building that have a fantastic world about like around them. There's not many books I've read multiple times. Um, I'm starting again with Harry Potter, but before that, I only read them once. Mm. Um, there was one book that I read, I think, five times. I've never read a book that many times. And that was, um, the German name is Brief für den König, which is The Letter for the King, which is a youth book. But this okay. one was so good in world building. And it's like a night story. It's not even fantasy, really. Or it is fantasy because it's not his strictly historical. But like there are no elves, no magic, as far as I remember. It's really just an adventure is story. Is that made into a Netflix, made it into I a, a think film, there, I think? I think there's been a film about it. I've never seen it, but uh, the book, there's two of them. Um, the, I, the Wilde Wald, which directly translated would mean The Wild Forest, would be the second one. But especially that first book, I think I read at least five times. Like That was one for me to escape reality, to dive back in, and I could read it over and over again. Mm. And the other one was um, Name of the Wind. Patrick Ruffers, because the world building and everything that's happening in this world is so good and so well written that it's just so much fun to read and just dive in again. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a few that I can quite happily go back to, and it like just like Andy, you know, the, the Douglas Adams stuff, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy, and um, in five parts. Yeah, trilogy in five parts, and. Uh, Oh, God. Dirk Gently. Um, yeah. Dirk Gently's Hollis Detective Agency is, again, amazing. And it, it coupled by like Rob Grant, uh, like Incompetence and things like that, and the uh, Red Dwarf books and things, are just sci-fi mm -hmm. comedy. Um, that are just, you know, they tend to be those sort of comedy books that are fantastic to, um, to just dip back into, to, they're just really good at, at making you feel all warm and fuzzy, or making me feel all warm and fuzzy anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, th things like um, Asimov and uh, Philip K. Dick, you know, those there's those kind of sci-fi stories that that really do it for me and and will allow me to read them multiple times. Especially yeah. like Philip K. Dick's short stories uh, are really good for that. Just yeah, that was like, actually. Uh, a there was stories. actually a book I read in only I think two days was uh, Neuromancer, which was also really good, especially mm. for the <laughs> for for the age of the book or the when it was written. That one was really really well, because it's... if you read it, you could think it would be written yesterday. The only thing that I kind of realized while reading the books there was no mentioning of cell phones. <laughs> So or smartphones like that. That part was missing about it, and it would have played completely different the whole thing if it would have existed. But I only, I think, in the last quarter of the book, I realized that. So everybody <laughs> who hasn't written it, Neuromancer, must read if you're into sci-fi because I think it pretty much defined a genre. Yeah, pretty much. Um... Everything's basically when it comes to cyberpunk or a dystopian Blade Runner style. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think finding when you find books that you really like, I think it, it's, it's I think it's quite magical, I think. Mm -hmm. and I, 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 I always find it quite sad when I kind of sort of meet people who say they, they, they never read books, never have. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of or yeah. you visit visit somebody's house and they have no books. For me, yeah. that's that's um, yeah. Books are just a. I mean, just look behind me. Yeah, there's there's book bookshelf there. There's two shelves here which are you know, there, half full there, of books. There is a reason why I called my channel Nerd Inventor, or I picked that name. <laughs> just, I played pen and paper for a long time. I love stuff that is world building. I always like fantasy. I always like to get lost in fantasy. I always used to be a little bit of a nerd. Um, I used to be an introvert when I was young, like really young. So I spent my summer vacation. I was, I, I didn't do sports. I hated soccer or football. I, 
hated Fair enough. sports yeah, of any kind. So I was laying up in the attic of my parents. There was a guest room and I was laying up there and I was reading books. That was my summer vacation, like six weeks summer vacation. But for me, six weeks only going down to drink and eat or if my parents kicked me out of the house to get a little bit of exercise and walk a little bit or else I would spend it reading uh, like three question mark, Alfred Hitchcock. Um, it's uh, TKKG. Uh, TKKG, I think it's called. Like also, it's, it's a little bit like the youth. It's a youth book uh, series, hmm. um, like the three question mark books, kind of like adventure in it. Blyton, um, five. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Five friends. Is that the There's name of it? Famous five. Uh, yeah, the famous five and the famous the, five. The fam, fam, famous five. Yeah. So I. The five find just, outers and dog as well. I think was another one. Yeah, they were, exactly, yeah. So and that, that those was, I was just reading the whole time, and then in school I met the other guys, and it started with video games, and then with pen and paper and live action role playing. Um, there were some huge ones in Europe that we went to. So this is why I love books, not just for the story, but also for the world they're creating. Mm. And when I there, there's been books where the story is absolutely shit, but the world is written so well that it's just. Well, this actually gives me an idea. I could make a pen and paper adventure out of that with like, okay, let me see, what could that be? Let me check that D&D rule book by what monster can I substitute that with? <laughs> yeah. There was, a, there was another Ian a Blyton book from my, my childhood. That it, was, it was The Faraway Tree, which had amazing world building. Um, okay. And it, it, it was the, the kind of... Um, premise of the whole kind of thing is that there was a the, this really really big huge tree that kind of stretched up to the clouds almost or, mm -hmm. or at least there were there were clouds at the top of the tree um and there were there were these creatures living in the creatures and people living in the tree sort of on the way up and it was a, okay. a um it was three kids who uh, sort of discovered the tree in the in the woodland outside the, the back of the house when they they'd moved to the country and um when you got to the top of the tree, there was like a, a a doorway, and they would let you into the doorway, into the clouds. But what would happen is in the clouds, there, there were lots and lots of different worlds that mm -hmm. were kind of on a timed rotation. So, depending on um, when you ended up going into the thing, depending, you know, it, it you didn't necessarily get the same world every time. Okay. So that sounds interesting. Was, That's a great youth book. I, absolutely, it was amazing. You know, as, as a kid, it was fantastic because they, they had like a, I think like a topsy turvy world. I think where everything was just upside down. You know, and people walking around and you know nice. handstands yeah. and you know all sorts of things like that. Um, th that there's, had some really really cool. There's also a German author for like talking about youth books. Um, it's uh, what's his name. Captain Nemo's Kinder, the, the, the children of Captain Nemo, Holbein is his name. Mm. What, what Wolfgang Holbein? I don't know if you guys know that. Never if he's heard, no. very famous, also, okay, because big, uh, he he's really famous. I think a German author. They, they once called him like the Stephen King of of the, the German Stephen King because he's just pumping out books like one <laughs> after another. Um, the uh, and he made uh, the children of Captain Nemo. And it's basically doing before the start of the Second World War, where, um, yeah, the kids find the um, the submarine, and the, then they not not the Nautilus, Nautilus yeah. yeah, and then they go on adventures with it, and they're all like 13, 14 years old, and that one is also really well written and sucks you in pretty good and also mm -hmm. the, the hardcover books they had like those green tinted pages like for, painted from algaes like on the outside colored so that was as, as a child that was where the pocket money went it's just like oh there's a new one coming out <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that, that i mean that's that's something i like about a book rather than a kindle or or some other kind of electronic format you know, yes actual physical i mean the last couple of days I've been reading uh, a Stephen a Stephen Lever book. It's kind of your crime thriller, MI5 chasing bad guys around London type thing. And it's it's 
I, I quite like them. They're nice, easy read. It's that there's no, it, there's no major world building involved in it. It there's not there's no major brain taxing. Yeah, yeah it's just a, it's a good story, and it, it it kind of engages you. I mean, the things are like hundred chapters, but it's kind of it just engages you. The short chapters you can read a bit, put it down, not a problem at all. But then there's a kind of like, like last night, I, I think I had about one hundred and thirty pages left. It was like, oh, well, I'm going to sit down and finish this. Yeah, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to finish this before I go to sleep. And it's it does kind of grab you in. And I think yeah. there's that kind of just that tactileness. And it, it possibly it's just you know, having grown up with paper books and loving paper books. Mm. That it just the copy I had, it's from, it's from our library. We, because you we live in a remote village, we have a mobile library. And this book had never been read. No one else had read this book. Do you think Absolutely it's a nostalgic brilliant. thing? Because I met a few people that started reading pretty late or like young, <laughs> younger people <laughs> <laughs> that um, group base grew up with smartphones and having everything accessible. Mm -hmm. And I, they do read over iPad, but I know a lot of people that still go into the bookstore or order the paperback books because they said they love the smell of yeah. a book and read from a book and yeah and this is something it's haptic like when you have it in your hands if you have a well-made book with a hardcover with like stamped or an imprint on it ah oh, it's it's so yeah it's an experience it's a, it's a it's a whole kind of absolutely. experience yeah i think i like that but i want to go about I've just kind of almost touching on to sort of the maker side of things as well but yeah, it's that idea and i was thinking about you yeah, like you were saying you you, you kind of got into you're into books and you you kind of you yeah, read books and then you kind of met kind of other people you mentioned that earlier with kind of like the the computers yeah. and the nerds getting together and I, I, a few times i've sort of thought over the years about how kind of having the right people or not kind of makes a difference to kind of the route one takes so for example Absolutely. i mean I, I i started i mean as a as a kid, small kid occasionally i had kind of uh you know, kids cartoons uh, comic books not comic books but just comics yeah. so things like the Beano uh, which is sort of classic British one and but then I had I, I wish I still had it I had the very first copy and, and for probably about six months to a year I was getting a weekly copy of 2000 AD you know so mm -hmm. Judge Dread, and then it, went, it kind of, nice. it dipped into sort yeah. of Star Wars world as well and I loved those um, but we we didn't have the money to sort of maintain them. That, I was essentially gifted them by a neighbour yeah. who kind of yeah, my sister had one and I had one, and it was just yeah, it's just this old gent, mm -hmm. and it was nice. But I don't recall anyone at school also being into those things. And I can remember kind of probably about fifteen or sixteen picking up uh, from sort of news agents a copy of a magazine called White Dwarf. Which was kind of you know all about sort of fantasy yep. and, and gaming, because I, I, I love fantasy books and I read lots of them. Yeah, and, and, and I had the for, White for Dwarf. many years. What was but the I never name of your into, <laughs> I never got into Dungeons and Dragons because there was no yeah. one else to kind of. I, I enjoyed reading kind of Red yeah. Dwarf and there were the, the stories in them and there were these sort of adventure game type stories where you kind of write. Okay, you can choose to go left or you choose to go right. If you go left, you kind of go to page this page. If you go right, you go to this page, and the story continues. I love to choose your own adventure. Swap back and forth. Fantastic. I, I love felt... those sort of things. Yeah. And the, the, the occasional kind of adventure spikes, game on computer that I kind of sort of played, but I never got into Dungeons and Dragons. Never okay. really bumped into people who played them. Probably until I was in my early thirties. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, then you kind of occasionally you sort of meet people, and when I moved down to the sort of southeast, so two thousand and nine, yeah, the the guys in the department I worked with, the majority of them were really into kind of sort of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, not just Dungeons and Dragons, yeah, the whole kind of gaming, the the minifigures, the the the, the rule books, they kind of yeah, and they were they were going off to events in yeah. London and, and elsewhere and regularly off to events at the local university and just really kind of getting into these things yeah. I, I didn't maybe I could have taken an opportunity then to get into it but I kind of maybe felt maybe just a bit too old perhaps uh, although yeah. they were they were this they were similar age to me but I kind of maybe felt I'm so far behind I'll never get back into that yeah. but I kind of think if I had met the, if I'd met them mm -hmm. 
in school, when I was in school, I may have taken an entirely different route. And I think the same thing can perhaps exist within kind of things like making. Yeah. Where, yeah, and I think this is where things like Maker Center are so it's good it. because you can kind of go, oh, yeah, this blacksmithing thing that I've I've just made this nail with Steve and 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 Al and Joe yeah. and and it's like I really like that or or you know you're spending time with a CNC or you're spending time with, um, oh yeah, the, the sessions that Ellen was running with a sewing machine and kind of you might think. I've never used a sewing machine before. I'll sit down and I'll sew something and go, I think I might go home and buy a sewing machine or you kind of do a lathe and go, I'm going to buy a lathe or the like. And we are also so enabled when it comes to that. Where we, My youth, starting with the whole nerd thing, I was just really lucky that we had so many friends or that I found so many friends that shared the same interest mm -hmm. and we were building that own space for us which therefore led to like learning more or meeting more people to do that. But now, now of days with the, like I said, maker community, for example, we are so enabled because we have the chance of doing that over the internet. Okay. That wasn't really around, those communities weren't around online. Now it's so easy to find like-minded people with any hobby that you have. Yeah. And it feels so good because I already, I always liked making stuff with my hands. Mm -hmm. I only started doing it more aggressively or because I really wanted to um, when I switched over from a service technician to working into sales. And I needed something to, I was drained mentally at the end of the day, but not physically. Also, my creativity was going down the drain with, as a salesperson, some might be creative, but it's not the main part of the job. So that was where I started doing stuff with my hands again. And it was, it felt so good finding people on the internet that were like-minded because suddenly that stuff I was making for myself, I wasn't that crazy guy that locked himself away in a workshop. I was just like, oh, there are actually people out there and I can feed off those crazy ideas. I love seeing people making crazy stuff and feed from their ideas and Oh, but what can I do different about it? Or is there a different way? Or, oh, I wonder how that works. I want to make something like that just to see if I can make it and if it works the same way. And so it's, you, you remember, I, I, I bet it's the same for you. When you were at Maker Central, you were coming back. On the one side, you got the Maker's Blues because you've seen people and you've been just talking to people all weekend long and you're absolutely happy about it. And then you have to say goodbye to those people. On the other side, my creativity was in full gear when I got back. Yeah. I was sitting in the plane. I was coming back in the middle of the day. I said hi to my wife. I talked to her a little bit. And then I, I need to go into the workshop. And I started <laughs> parallel on like three different projects, <laughs> ordered stuff on the internet because I wanted me to do that. And, oh, I talked to that guy. And, oh, this is really cool. And, oh, how can I prepare for the next year? And then next year didn't happen. And it's been two years since that because I've only been to the one in 2019 and I hope this year is going to happen. Uh -huh. yeah. I hope so too. I, I I have a feeling it will. Because yeah. I think perhaps, yeah, the, 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 the widely released human malware that's <laughs> been affecting us all for the last two years, I think maybe has reached a point it where... It drink then. <laughs> has reached a point where things will happen i i, I suspect I well, hopefully enough of the um, hopefully enough of the patches have been applied yes to, uh, to, to yeah. mitigate the, the spread of the, yeah, the malware yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, no yeah, more rollbacks yeah <laughs> i had uh, there's ne we're never going to be back to the the old normal no and but that's a, that's, that's life anyway yeah, there's no such thing as normal, and and things change. That's the only constant in life is change. And Except for vendor machines. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's just it's just that. Yeah, I, th I I I I hope I really hope it goes ahead because I I kind of need that fix. Yeah, I think this we that, all that's do. the general consensus, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, guys. Excuse me for. One minute, I'll be right back. 
<laughs> I, I just did not. Bio break. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I completely lost audio, and then I, I missed what Jan was saying partway through his, uh, his thing. I had, I had technical difficulties. Where I, yeah. uh, <laughs> it just suddenly went all garbled. Yeah, yeah I think I, I, mean, I, 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 I think Baker Central will go ahead. I don't know whether it will be anything like it was. I don't know what things will be put in place at the NEC. I think there'll be a lot of people kind of walking around in masks still. Absolutely. Even yeah. if it's not mandated, I probably will. Um, well, March think... is the the deadline for when they're going to drop that as a requirement over here. But I suspect yeah. I'll probably... I think a lot of people are going to... It, have I think it with me if I'm not wearing Like it. it is in some other parts of the world where oh, yeah, people, people got colds. Or you're going out in the general public. You put a mask on. I mean, I mean everyone that's ever been to a... a, a a comic con or the like knows about things like con flu you know just that yeah. idea that you go to an exhibition whatever it is you're shaking hands with lots of people you're touching lots of things you generally don't feel well the last few days particularly if you're you yeah. know maybe not eating well drinking maybe perhaps more than you should it's but even if it's just a large volume of people in a small space enclosed there's you always kind of you're bound to pick up something and I think people yeah. will in those situations kind of probably wear masks a lot in order to kind of go you know what yeah it might not be mandated anymore but it's a really good idea and I'm going to carry well, I, that on I think that's the thing okay. is that I think it, it, it's made it a little bit more acceptable because if, if, yeah. if two or three years ago you you wandered out into the into the the general mass of the populace in the UK wearing a mask, people would have thought something was really weird. Yeah, you know. Whereas now, it's it's become part of the new norm, and it's something I'm I'm quite happy with. You know, it, it's normalising not coming to work if you've got a steaming cold and things like that. You know, that's something I, like the the listeners will know that I, I suffer quite badly with my sinuses, have done for decades. Um, so you know, if if someone comes into the office with a cold, that yeah, they might feel a little bit rough for a couple of days, but it might knock me out for a week. Um, yeah. You know, severe headaches and sinus infection and things like that. So for them, something that's that's a couple of days of slight Indeed, awkwardness yes. and feeling a bit crap. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, you know, it might take me out completely. Uh, you know, put me off work because I can't function. Yeah. Um, you know, and normalising not doing that is a really, really good thing for me. You know, and, and you know, we've got a couple of guys in the office who are, uh, have issues with, with various things that are exacerbated by having a cold. So getting to so, that sort of situation where you don't do that is going to be quite yeah. nice. I have hay fever. Um, like my allergies are pretty bad. And Corona was not the best time for having allergies. It's great no. if you want space around you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's also carrying. <laughs> it's also carrying like five masks with you because if you start sneezing in the in the middle of the street, you can throw that mask away. Just put on the next one. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's, uh, I I remember that I I started crazy giggling to myself my wife looked at me and it's like are you crazy because we were walking into a bank and I just like imagine one and a half years ago i walked into a bank wearing a mask <laughs> totally Absolutely. That, would have, that would have gone well yeah must be like in the uk you can't even go into um like a lot of uh fuel stations where you, you know you go in and um fill your car up with petrol and you can't go into there to pay for your petrol if you've got you know like a um a motorbike helmet on yeah so if, you, if you've ridden up to put fuel in your motorbike and then go to pay they'll ask you to take your helmet off before you pay you know things like that whereas now you can't go in without a mask on <laughs> yep <laughs> that how is things true. change how the turntables yeah. <laughs> oh yeah yeah i think that's going to be a, a a nice change i think um to hopefully just kind of Make people more aware of their own impact on other people in terms of like they're not gonna learn. 
I think some, some hope, yeah. some if, might. If you're going, <laughs> if you if you're going like, you really have to cough or sneeze to get some room at the supermarket. So every time I'm there buying groceries and I'm at the registers and it's not going faster, I have the people in front of me and even they have the lines on the ground and I stay there and I can basically feel the other person breathing down my yeah. neck, just like rubbing on me, trying to get their stuff on that um, mm -hmm. transport thingy. Yeah, yeah, it's just conveyor belt. It's just it's driving me insane. And they look all pissed. If you turn around, it's like, well, you can be friendly. It's like, could you please keep your distance? And they look at you like, it's just, I, I, I had to do the same thing in a in a, a subway store um, buying a sandwich, and there was a guy on. This was when you know masks were mandated in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, and it was everything everywhere for a couple of months had been two meters distance, and masks when you go in anywhere. And I'd, I'd walked into subway, and there was I think two or three customers in there already, masks, staff wearing masks, me with a mask, and I'm stood there waiting. And then a guy walks in on his phone, no mask, and stands like right behind me you know if he'd, if he'd have got an erection i'd have felt it he was that close you know and i had to like turn around and i was like dude just <laughs> you know there's yeah. signs all over the place and we're all stood here you know come on he's like oh uh, yeah. oh, uh, uh. <laughs> well yeah i think it, i think it'll be interesting to see how make a central is different and it'd be interesting to see how kind of people react to things. I mean there was there was yeah. a lot of hugging, there was a lot of handshaking at the last one. I like yeah, I think maybe it's strange kind of yeah, not now shaking hands with people. I mean oh. I I met up with an old colleague just before Christmas and it's like yeah you know, any previous time would have would shaken hands. Absolutely. I don't think you automatically I don't think it's, no thought about it. I don't mm. think it's gonna work if I mean this has the potential of being a super spreading event, except the fact that there is with the new variant going through, it's more like a slight cold. But people basically, if you look at Spain and the other ones, they're basically already saying it's like okay, we're gonna treat that as the common flu from now on because yeah. Like that that's the new plan isn't it is to well it, the, the assumption is that has, has sort to. Of by the end of feb has most to. of europe and the uk will have been exposed to imagine it. a couple thousand makers inside a hall and then you got four or five hundred of them in the evening at the marriott down at the bar with a couple of drinks oh, the Hilton and bar, that's yeah. and that's the latest point where the hugging starts because yeah and then it's basically well what is more important is basically your physical health or your mental health at that point yeah <laughs> because it does things with you if you see your parents and you can't even hug your parents or like your best friends or people you've not seen in years like this is killing me in the inside and i think we're getting to a point especially with the i mean it should be 2g like fully vaccinated booster no no question asked about that but at one point you have to kind of like live a little bit of normality. This is my. Yeah. I would respect anyone that says like, "Well, please keep your distance." I would completely respect that. But mm -hmm. I, in my case, I've kind of locked down to the point where it's like, okay, if I get it now, I should be safe enough to not end up at the hospital. And that's basically where I cross the line because everything else is just gonna kill me at one point because this is yeah, it's getting too much. It's been really? for so many years where I felt uncomfortable with more like than five people in the room, and mm. so I don't want to do that anymore. Maybe this is something we could, you know, collectively as as a group of podcasts to kind of, you know, it, it's it's fairly common for a lot of the makers to listen to a lot of the, the makers' podcasts. So maybe we can kind of get the idea together and crowdsource it to, you know, for the makers to all have. A badge or something that you know, if, if they're uncomfortable with with you know, no no touching no hugging no, no badge, hugging yeah. or you know hug friendly or you know for, for people's comfort levels for yeah you know that but kind he, of thing. I think it, but is there a need for perhaps that to be uh, something that maybe is uh, a little bit more techy so that if there are certain people you might want to hug but other people you don't. <laughs> So the, well, uh, if you, like if you go up to a selective. person, you, if you want to go up to a person, to, uh, to, if you're going up to a person and you want to hug them and they pull a taser on you, 
You know they probably don't want to be hugged. <laughs> hey, it's so good to see. <laughs> I don't know, like Garth of Wayne's World with the with the full cattle prod on the on the belt, the utility belt. <laughs> yeah, there's like this is a one point five meter baton. <laughs> good good luck, just <laughs> walking through. Yeah, so, uh, we're a bunch of makers that could get really dangerous. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or, or, the, or the or the other option is yeah something akin to a sort of a Dalek kind of yeah. You know, you should drive around with literally a, a sort of a Dalek yeah, inside it. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm waiting for the first one driving around shooting darts with vaccination screen. Vaccinate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we have had our very own Maker Dalek driving around Maker Central just randomly prodding people. And he's True, in the there chat. Was, there, there was, was Dan. Dalek. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they put oh, yeah, Dan okay. on his You're talking about Dan. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's true. There were those um, R2-D2s, and I think there was also a Dalek, if I remember. Was, yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, PodPad Studios. Yeah, that's they, still on my list. to be there again. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. one of my lists where I wish I would have more space, because I want to make one so bad out of one of those old um, like electric wheelchairs and just <laughs> build a Dalek around it. Oh, that would be so much fun, just driving through the city with the sound modules, just screaming at people, exterminate. <laughs> See them jumping. Oh, I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah. Daleks on my my wish list to build. It just doesn't make sense in Germany. Like, not many people know Doctor Who, so Is it's just not? like people okay. would completely freak out seeing a diff, like seeing a Dalek driving through, but they would not understand where it's coming from. <laughs> no. Would there is an fun, episode. Though. There is an episode where. It's actually set. A part of it is set in Germany. Okay. Um, and the Daleks are saying the equivalent of exterminate in German. Hmm. It was. Um, Zerstören? Auslöschen? I'm pretty sure they would. I have to check that because I, I think I've seen all of them. Which which epi like? Um... It was. Uh, it was Tennant, David Tennant. And I think and it was one of it. the episodes where it was the kind of the mini ser mini section series where the master had him trapped on a carrier, and it was Martha yeah. Jones was going around, and she was there was a, a facility in Germany which contained possibly uh, I would have to a giant nuclear that. bomb, and they were going to basically blow the world up. Okay, if I remember uh, correctly. Tenant. I think that's the best. Oh no, wait, no, no politics. I'm not gonna start with one. It's the best doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can stay with the politics. Yeah, mostly ish. Yeah, no, huge, huge talent fan. Like, I really like his doctor. Well, there's 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 a rumor going around the UK at the moment that he's going to be the next doctor. So play the doctor again. Oh, that would be. But only for three, crazy. only potentially for three episodes. He says, "Hold four mm. fingers up." He's <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, but it could. It, it's a rumor that may or may not be true. It supposedly come from a good source that did, was a reliable source for a previous big announcement about Doctor Who. But as a number of people thinking that it's just a bit of a, a bit marketing of a push. Yeah, yeah, might be. But it would be good. I did be. enjoy the the last season, though. I have to say, the writing's gotten a lot better. Not that it could get any worse, but <laughs> it's it's more in line with the um, older Doctor ones, like the coherent story in the in the background. And it had its ups uh, and downs. There's some good bits and better bits, true, and some not so good bits. But yeah. I think I have a lot of things. I th I, th I think sometimes people spend too much time thinking about some of these things rather than just sitting back and enjoying it yep but well, it's... I, I, as that that um scandinavian fellow said you know it's all it's all um it, it's all our own kind of uh i can't even remember words completely forgotten words <laughs> but what rasmus was talking about the other week about it being everyone's kind of um our own kind of uh, fan fiction of, of what we want yeah. it to be 
you know, so everyone. Yeah, if, it, does really, if, head, if it doesn't quite match what we want it to be, then we kind of have this thought of no, yeah, it's not, it's not right. But I think yeah, exactly. It's like for me, for you, know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy film. Mm -hmm. I I really don't like it. I mean, Martin Freeman, oh. great actor. I love the stuff he does. Um, but there was just so much with that film that just didn't sit right with me because mm -hmm. I spent my teenage years growing up with the book and the radio series. Yeah, the sometimes TV you series. just see stuff in your eyes yeah. butchered by other people when it comes to that. Yeah, that's it's having fair. a head under his chin rather than side by side. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like, yeah, it's in the book. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a description. Like, and Douglas Adam was very, very specific about his characters. He there's was there's no much room for film, great, but... yeah. There's no much room for um, how do you say it? Uh, creative, um, creative license. freedom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in that one. Although, as Thomas just said in the chat, yeah, there is there's is there a definitive version of Hitchhikers? Yeah, some would argue there isn't. Well, this is this is pretty much what Adams wanted as well, though, wasn't it? Is to to not have a definitive version, it's to to have each medium with its own, True. its own defining characteristics. Yeah, but I think I think I think, just, I think the film is just too far out for me compared to the other ones that I kind of <laughs> yeah, immersed in, and and that creates that dissonance that kind of you know, yeah, where people then go, oh no, that that was. It's like yeah, Doctor Who. I I really enjoyed the Doctor Who, the last Doctor Who series. There were some bits I thought, mm. but for the most part, I enjoyed it. But my youngest, who's much much bigger Whovian than I am, was just like, oh, that, that didn't like that episode. That was appalling, and listed off a dozen reasons why that episode was appalling. <laughs> and somebody'd be sitting here watching, yeah, watching it together, and your yeah, face would just be kind of. Rather than kind of actually enjoying it, yep. Um, yeah, a friend and I have a similar sort of thing with um, well, the, the the Marvel films, for instance, because he's very or has been very into the comics, so has a lot of the background lore and everything. And I, I haven't, I just I haven't done comics. So for me, like so, yeah. all of the MCU is all fresh to me it's all new i know none of it so i i go into any of the things watching them for what they are um and quite often you know i'll, I'll get to the end of like i watched eternals recently and i really enjoyed it and my mate had also recently just watched it so like he said oh, let me know when you finished it let me know when you finished it so I did and, and i you know i was like oh, I, I really enjoyed it quite like this quite like that and, and he listed off a big list of reasons why he hated it so, was there anything you actually enjoyed in the film? Because all that you've done there is given me a handful of reasons why it was awful. That are you know things that I I hadn't even noticed those things in it because I just watched and enjoyed the film. I hadn't I hadn't spent the whole two yeah. two hours picking it to bits, and, and that was just it was stuff that he just picked up on because it was stuff that was you know in his in his head kind of. Always depends on if you're watching something strictly for entertainment or if you're watching something. But we can enjoy that. I can enjoy all of the Marvel movies because I never read any comics. Well, I did read the old Spider-Man, mm -hmm. and but other than that, I basically just watch the movies, enjoy them. What I do if I throw in a Marvel movie, I order pizza, I get myself something to drink. And preferably like watch it with my wife or a buddy that's also into that stuff and i would just basically turn up the speakers to form the surround system and we just watch everything explode for Most about an hour and a half yeah. to two hours and then i switch it off and it's like great let's watch another one let me just check the freezer if we have ice cream <laughs> that's what they're for that that's for me i'm not looking for something accurate or something like that i i love the the comic relief the jokes in there the action and for that they're great and if i want something artsy and i want something different then i'm watching an um anderson movie 
<laughs> then I'm going to watch like Hotel Budapest for the RC stuff or I watch a drama for something else, but that's an action movie. And if somebody comes up and says, like, well, that's so unrealistic, then I'm like, there's a big purple that's alien yeah. snapping with his fingers, destroying people. Like, which, which, like, you have to point it out. Which, which part is unrealistic about it? Like, like what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. And even even kind of realistic movies are often entirely unrealistic. Yeah, yeah how, many, how many kind of action films are there with kind of a, a shooting scene and I think, yeah, they should have run out of bullets thirty seconds ago and <laughs> yeah, changed the magazine and oh, they haven't. Yeah, yeah there's, there's probably only there's probably only a handful of films where they get things like that correct. Yeah, I was yeah, just about they... to say that there's a handful of um, channels that on YouTube that do like the, they'll do analysis on films or TV, and they'll get an expert on the subject. Um, yeah, I follow one of what it's to called, but do yeah. those breakdowns. And John Wick was one of those that got a lot of stuff very, very, very right. Um, yeah. especially with stuff like the the gun stuff. And I, I know one of them was talking about. Um, specifically with reloading a couple of the handguns one of the handguns is notorious for jamming so one of the moves that Keanu does in it is to is to check the chamber to make sure that it's loaded the first um the first bullet but he doesn't do it on the other handguns because they're not renowned for jamming jamming. okay so and it, it was a specific choice that for that particular pistol he would check the chamber you know it's just one of those little things that you know a, a professional weapons expert would sort of picked up on but nobody else in the audience would have they did just seen it as a throwaway you know kind of thing but it was actually you know doing it properly oh they want rain and snow for the next couple of days i think i have to rewatch those john wicks again <laughs> <laughs> they could feel uh, to do like them they're hideously violent but yep. yeah they they're ridiculous but they're amazing Yes. Is it, they've, they've said as well that as long as people go and watch them, they'll continue to make them. It's they just, the same, it's same as Boondock Saints. They have a cult status, this movie. It's just, you, yeah. you're sitting there, you watch it like 20 times, and then one scene comes and it's like, no, the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Lou Diamond Phillips film back in, I want to say, 96, called The Big Hit. Mm hmm. Absolutely amazing action film in terms of okay. all the tropes. Completely does not take itself seriously in any way. But I mean, there's a bit where because it, it's a it's a handful of assassins who okay. end up trying to make a bit of extra money on the side and kidnap someone, but kidnap the wrong person. But uh. they're they're on this job. Uh, at the very start and it's you know big huge fancy mansion and of course there's the guy you know there's the the big hairy sweaty bloke with you know in the hot tub with a load of blonde bombshells half his age the usual kind of story uh and they you know they, they sort of burst into the room it, and there's there's four of them and there's two of them just basically stood to one side drinking coffee you know randomly just shooting you know they, they haven't even come into the, to the bit where they're meant to be um you know killing the guy they're just off off enjoying the coffee waiting for the other guy you know the main mark Wahlberg to do all this uh all this stuff you know yeah i come swinging into the room spinning around on the floor taking out all out the, the bodyguards and um shoots the guy in the thing and then he's more of the, the henchmen come running after him and stuff and he's he's rolling down it's like a, a big sort of ornate staircase you know, it sweeps down into this. You know, I think I've seen that movie. Bottom. I remember parts of that. Really, and he, really he's cool. rolling down. So he's, the the banister is like on his on his neck or his shoulders or something. As he's rolling down and still shooting, as he as he flicks back around, he'll shoot another one. As he's, it's like so far beyond the realms of possibility in like any way. Shape number or form. seven crank. Yeah. Yeah. It's but it is just Red. it's so ridiculous. But it is hilarious to watch. Because it's hugely dated now, anyway. But it's mm-hmm. you know anyone who's into films needs to check that out. I, I like movies who don't take themselves too seriously, which don't take themselves too seriously. Um, Red, retired, extremely yeah, dangerous, love funny as films. hell. Just just yeah. the, those are my kind of movies because the comic book seldom... adaptations. 
I seldom watch dramas because I, for me, it is an escape watching a movie to get away. So I'm there's documentaries, but mainly like animals or archaeological ones, um, travel ones. But yeah, no, no, not really, not that big into dramas. I watch them once in a while if the movie is really good. But I want to be taken away. I want to be distracted by everything that's going on in this world. And there's enough negative stuff. So I want something where I can laugh and get myself like on yeah different thoughts. Definitely. Yeah. I'm aware it's uh, it's half past midnight for you at the moment. Um, True. So yeah, obviously this is not a, this is not a quick process for the next bit. But yeah, maybe we should start talking about the uh, the things that grab our attention, um, which can be multiple and anything you know, sort of going on. And so yeah, what's been grabbing your attention yet? What's been my oh, what's grabbing my attention this your attention week? Grabbers is um i've because of the whole nerd thing we talked about it and you guys know it's like a huge fan when it comes to the old consoles and stuff um i found a channel and it's a german youtuber but the channel's in english and it's called there ought to be and that guy is uh mainly a programmer and what he did in his last project is he took no, well, he didn't take a Game Boy. He designed a Game Boy cartridge with a wireless module in it, oh, which nice allowed cool. him to throw pictures and um, also like live feed onto the Game Boy on that old display. Within the last one, he's shown basically he's playing GTA V on a Game Boy, <laughs> and he says like really like I'm not running it on the Game Boy. I'm playing it on the Game Boy. Like the processing and everything is done by the PC, but he got some lanes open so he can control the character with the Game Boy, and you can see it on a like 120 <laughs> pixel by 140 pixel like GTA 5 <laughs> running through it. And the name of the channel is awesome. There Ought to Be. So there's two videos about that Game Boy or that cartridge that he made, and it's open source. Oh, so nice. cool. uh, he put the plants and everything online for it, and it just looks so cool if you see that like old yellow Game Boy that he's playing on and you see GTA 5 like running on the screen and of course Crisis <laughs> of course <laughs> the while, while, the, while, while the whole time saying of, like, it's not running Crisis I'm playing it <laughs> yeah. have you seen the, the upgrade screens you can get the, the retrofit modules yes for, I, I do uh, um I do have some of them. I have an LCD screen. Um, I have not installed it yet. I did the Game Boy. I have a Game Boy Color, which I copper plated for myself, and also uh, put the new screen in. The, that one has an LCD there. one. Yeah, that is that's really nice. And I did it on the Game Boy Color because I do have about fifty Game Boy games and some Game Boy Color games. So I just love that. Yeah. So this is why. And with the Game Boy Color, it's good. I, I'm usually not a big fan about that ultra high resolution screen because then I can mm -hmm. just play an emulator on something. But it really yeah. is well. I, I kind of like the not the, the newest LCD screens on those, but the kind of like the ones that are already four to five years old, because mm -hmm. they're the perfect mix. They're still the same resolution. They don't upscale, but they just add the backlight for it so i was it's about just to say the, the backlight makes all the difference exactly it's they're um, low energy so the battery lasts a long time you can play with them you get the nice popping colors of the game boy color because the game boy color was not backlit people forget that the game mm -hmm. boy advance i think was but the advanced the sp was the um the exactly the sp model. yeah not even the normal game boy advance added true mm -hmm. so this and this is a nice um, change for it so that it still looks retro, you can still play it. The only thing it adds the light in the background and it makes it actually playable. <laughs> no more lit magnifier sitting at the top of the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that magnifier. But then you have as soon as you have light on the screen, it reflects and you can't see, <laughs> see any of it. So that's that's the other downside on it. A generation but, yeah. of millennials who are car sick because they've spent hours and hours and hours in the back of a car with a magnifier two inches away from their face <laughs> yeah what they were training for in the evening when they have to switch off the light and they do that under the blanket yeah. and continue playing yeah with two really really low power lights <laughs> yeah. 
and then they had those power bricks on the side <laughs> so basically and they were mainly just to switch the batteries because you plugged them in and it did gray brick on the side and then you had power and you could continue playing and then before you pulled it off you had to just just swap the batteries because it, uh, friends of my parents he bought the kids for christmas a game boy and they never played with that game boy because after the christmas holidays he went out and bought them a second one but after on Christmas, like he basically showed them how to use it, and he started playing Tetris, and he didn't stop for the next two days. <laughs> huh? so, the, <laughs> so my buddy and his sister, who he bought it for, they weren't allowed to play with it, and he continued playing with it. And he did that. He was a master of hot swapping. That Game Boy was because he was beating high scores in Tetris. That thing was on for weeks at a time because he would play it when he came home at lunch he would eat and then sit down and play for like 15 20 minutes before going mm -hmm. back to work and that thing would be plugged in on the power brick and nobody was allowed to touch that cable <laughs> and there would be batteries in it and then he would just plug it in pull the batteries put new batteries in then carefully unplug the power to be able to walk around with it and continue <laughs> playing <laughs> yeah oh, with that dedication that was that yeah. was the 90s 96 97 something like that yeah. <laughs> we're talk, talking of that putting that module into the um the game boy cartridge that reminds me of the meme jamie i think you sent around earlier in the week talking about um the antikythera mechanism and about the reason why it's locked away one is to protect this you know three thousand year old computer yeah. uh the other is to stop you know millennials putting trying to put doom on it yeah, <laughs> we would. <laughs> it's and it's funny that you mentioned that because the programmer says he put out a question about what he should play over it, and then people said Doom, and he said it's like, well, it's that's pretty stupid for two reasons. First of them, like Doom can basically run on a potato, like this is one right. of the benchmarks, and the second one, it's still calculated by the pc all it's doing is sending over the data yeah <laughs> so yeah that was that was one of them but yeah doom was basically on there and i've seen so many people with installing it on calculators and stuff yeah <laughs> pretty much <laughs> useful if you get bored in the exam and you've finished yeah <laughs> other than that what was what's been on my mind this week or what's been grabbing my attention well at the beginning of the last week it was uh harry potter the books not anymore <laughs> until we broke you exactly <laughs> thoughts of revenge <laughs> <laughs> and, you, yeah. and you're not going to tell us what you've uh, changed the uh, your attention from harry potter to <laughs> <laughs> no not not gonna happen <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Other, yeah. There, there's what's been grabbing my attention. Otherwise, is uh, and there's a huge thing. Uh, stop motion. I started dabbling in stop motion. Mm -hmm. I dusted off my DSLR. It started um, a few, well, about a month back, um, and on the Black Friday sale, I got myself a resin 3D printer, and I made a. Um, for the DSLR, I made an activator or a, a trigger, external trigger over a photo diode. So cool. basically just sort it on a photo diode and put it on the back where the, the fan spins. So every time it activates, it would make a picture, which gives That's it that cool. nice fluent movement when it comes out of the resin. And it's so easy to make, but that just that hearing that click of the mirror made me kind of like oh yeah that was good time shooting pictures and then i remembered i've seen half a year ago or so from um craftsman he was yeah. saying something about stop motion and i usually don't watch his channel i'm subscribed to him and i think that stuff he's making is wonderful i just have a really hard time um identifying his accent i have a hard time understanding him i have yeah, to watch so I many things that. yeah yeah, f so for me, as well, I wouldn't say I'm not really a native speaker, I'm pretty much fluent, but dialects will 
sometimes they're too much. So this was really hard. So I started watching him from there. I just started watching stop motion in general. And that led me down another rabbit hole where I just I'm soaking everything up. And it started from the technical aspect. I got that down now. I got my EOS 1100D. Um, I, I started securing everything. You get an external trigger. Now I'm more in the models because what a lot of people do is like they love to play with the Legos, which yeah. just makes completely sense because it's modular. You can move them, you can mm -hmm. make them. But still, I think it's nicer to have um, like those models and i'm thinking about maybe 3d rendering them this is why i'm also getting into fusion at the moment and um, printing them in different poses to get actual plastic figures reins to move where you can't see any joints so it, it gives it more fluent motion so this is one idea i'm having but i'm just playing around with it at the moment but this has been i've been completely focused or like yeah concentrate on that learning that and there's like a little bit of fusion coming into it. There's the technical side. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm going in pretty deep. So this is why it's probably no, going to take a while until <laughs> the next video is <laughs> going to be released because I really want to go in that direction. Sounds and maybe good, it's just going to be for yeah. one video or maybe I'm just going to have so much fun and I'm going to do more of it. I don't know yet. You're doing it for you and that's the main the main thing. That's the main reason to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I'm having a lot of fun with it and I'm for the first time in a while I have the the feeling I'm learning something completely new mm. because I've never been into modeling like in movements, how to get fluent movements and that I can't draw, I can't draw for shit. Like everything I draw looks like a five-year-old smeared on a piece of paper. <laughs> so uh, for me, it's really hard getting those kind of details and movements. So I'm basically standing in front of the mirror, moving my arms and I, ah, okay. So, <laughs> ah, that's why it looks wrong. And I go back and I, <laughs> try to modify it so yeah that's that's one of the things i nice. really like at the moment cool. look forward to that jamie what's been yes. having your attention two this week that i'm gonna gonna shout out one of them is the the free game on the epic store at the minute called relector it's a little indie one but it's a physics based uh puzzle game similar sort of ilk to things like portal and stuff it's a um, you know a, a cube thing in it that's very similar to the companion cube and stuff, but it's very cool. Um, it's it's changing magnetism and gravity. But it's, it's very very fun. So I've started playing that. Uh, and the other thing is the channel Cybabe on Facebook and Instagram and the website and everything. Um, Yvette, which is a, a very 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 awesome science communicator. And she does a deep dive called uh, Moment in Science, or Mom Moments of Science, um, almost every day. Uh, it's so, so fun. Just the way it's written, it's, it's unapologetically for us type of people. You know, she'll dive into something and give you a full breakdown on like, she did the, the why Chernobyl melted down or a particular. Um, type of animal that's based, or that, that Pikachu is based on, which is this high <laughs> high altitude mountain rabbit type thing. Um, and oh, I thought why? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a, it, it's this particular thing that that is what Pikachu is based on, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, big ear lives in high altitude, but it's super sensitive to temperature, and you like a, a full. You know, break down on on that, and just a completely varied and diverse set of skills, uh, but all beautifully researched and well well explained. Um, yeah, that, definitely one for grown ups. It's it, it's not a uh, yes. It's 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 not not, not well, age children, and and then that, that that's absolutely fine. I think it's it it, a bit it, sweary. Yeah, it's good. To, <laughs> It, it's good to see i mean I've, I've obviously science communication is, is is kind of a bit of my bag and and it, it i think it's important that we have science communicators that are working to aim at different audiences yeah and i i wasn't familiar before you you mentioned her this week to me yeah and de yeah definitely some interesting stuff uh oh definitely work. yeah yeah 
I mean, she's got a science background and a science communication background and a writing background and things. Um, and she, and you said it's a written blog. Yeah, so she's got a, a Facebook page. Is how I, I consume the content. Okay. Um, but the YouTube channel seems to be kind of almost like kind of almost podcasts. I I didn't actually watch any of the videos, but all the videos appear to be kind of at least an hour long. Yeah. Talking to other people. Yeah, I, like I am. I, I do not use Facebook. Like for me, it's <laughs> it's all I, all the stuff's on our website as well. So um, yeah, side, that side sounds great. Um, yeah, it's, re it's really really well written. Uh, like I said, it's it's it, it's a, a small digest on a particular topic, but it will give you you know as as an adult with a short attention span but an interest in all of the things. It's really nice to be able to just go. Oh, what's this particular topic about? Oh, it's it's about, you know, nineteen mm fifties -hmm. um, housewives and their drug fueled lives, based on you know what was what was acceptable in the fifties, uh, you know, and how how everyone was running on methamphetamine, you know, and yes. things like that. Um, so you know, it'll be, it'll be just like a five minute read uh, breakdown on something like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Fun story on that one. <laughs> a buddy of mine, his grandfather used to be um, an apothecary, I think it's called. Yeah, Ap yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So no, uh, fine, they yeah. they they were cleaning up at the parents' house. They were cleaning up the addict, and they found old com like prospects that they would give out to the customers mm -hmm. uh, in German, like the old printed ones for basically uh, coke. And other stuff. It's like, are you feeling a little bit down? Take crack, basically. So it's like, or Absolutely. it's like, help helps the wife and the child. And you look at it, it's like that's speed. Okay. <laughs> it's just like what? <laughs> so yeah, he's, I mean, he posted those pictures. It's like, do you? And I would, I, I did, I had to Google it because like some of the names did, did not ring a bell. It's like, oh yeah, that's heroin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You having anxiety? Take some of that. <laughs> it, that that's that's what's so shocking is just how prevalent that kind of stuff was before we realized just how bad it was. Yeah, and there are my grandparents losing their shit about um, finding out that their children smoked weed. Yeah. It's like I'm so agitated about it. I'm so stressed. I'm just gonna take some heroin. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, well, well, times times change. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're awfully quiet about that. I mean, <laughs> if, if if you talk to your grandparents or like people that are eighty five, around like eighty eighty five years old, for some reason they don't talk about those good old times. Well, it's, it's because there's nothing left of their heads, so they can't remember anything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fair. <laughs> Yeah. Talking of the past, hey. Andy, what's what's been grabbing your attention, mate? <laughs> <coughs> uh, well, a, a few things for me this week. Um, let's have a look at my little list. Uh, I read a book. Yeah, which I haven't done for a while. Yeah, Stephen Le Stephen Stephen Lever, uh, the the runner. Yeah, a, a good little thriller, easy read. Um, I don't want to say much more about that. Uh, yesterday was the virtual craft fair. Uh, JP and Dale and Carl Jacobson put together. Uh, a lot of people took part in. There was some really good episodes. I managed to dive into a few of them, not all of them, but I managed to dive into a few. So well worth looking back at. Mm. Uh, the Jimmy yeah, Duresta, Jimmy Duresta one was was quite an interesting one. It was half and half with him just kind of reading comments people kind of going oh, I love you Jimmy and the kind of the other half was kind of some interesting little sort of tidbits um, so quite a few, yeah, a few of those as usual worth going back and having a look at mm. yeah uh, James from Malta make yeah, if you want to know how to install a beer tap in your house then go and go and watch James's one <laughs> I missed um, I missed that one but I saw I'm sorry to interrupt you there I saw else because of fits perfectly into the nerdy th stuff with the foot pedal for the yeah. shooter. Oh my god, that was so great because it reminded me of the old arcade ones where you just step on it to go behind Time cover. Crisis and yeah. 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 Totally. That was that was a good one. I did catch quite a bit of that one. I don't think I don't think I saw all of any one of them. 
um, apart from Jimmy Duresta's one. But mm. there they were there were some really good episodes again, as as there have been for the previous ones. So it usually is, yeah. I certainly recommend people going and sort of checking out some of those sort of episodes. Yes, they're longer format; they're, they're fifty minutes to to an hour, uh, but generally worth it uh, to have a look at. Uh, talking to James again, there was. Um, he put a video out this week showing how he made the Welsh Captain America um, oh, yes. shield for so for the Fools of Tools treasure trade, which is awesome. Um, really which is video. yeah, as, as you would expect from James. Yeah, as so, uh, soon as it's multi anyway, his his latest uh, video up on Instagram today, today, yesterday, whatever it was, this week uh, about the espresso. Yeah, yesterday. The espresso, absolutely got to go check Worth it out because yeah, beautifully done. I have to watch I'll, that. I've, I'll I see if I can link that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see if I can link that because that was a really. Is good it video. a reel or what? what, what no, it's just a, as a standard post. Oh, nice. Yeah, IG, okay, IGTV, good. I think yeah. Uh, actually, it's not IGTV, but I, I think it might be a reel. But it's yes, it's. I think it is a reel. Uh, unfortunately, he's got. He came up in the. Came up on the on the. Just in the main posts for me. Yeah, but real some reels will sometimes. Yeah, in Instagram does weird stuff. I mean, yeah, Instagram does weird things. Um, I'm talking of actually talking to James. Uh, arranged <laughs> yesterday, we will have, be having him on in March. Good. Got him booked in. Checked. Okay, got arranged with his uh, shift patterns. So yeah, I think if I remember off the top of my head, 27th of March, if I remember correctly. Uh, having him on, so that'd be that'd be a nice chat. Yes. Um, another good another good video this week. Kids invent stuff. Uh, previous guests, uh, yeah. Ruth Amos, and future guest uh, Sean, Sean Brown. Brown. Yep, they put a video out. A classic uh, kids invent stuff, building crazy invention that some kid has suggested. Um, but it was in a musical format. The musical, yeah, and it's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely, with, just with... kind of. As I as I understand it, with uh, some guest vocals from our good friend Ali as well. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and it, it it it's it's so well done. It really is. It's classic, classic musical theatre, um, and it's just it's it's delightful. It it, it 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 kind of like you can't watch it and not smile. To be honest. Um, so and then, and the last one I found out this week I won't go, I won't go, kind of go into details but I found out this week that somebody who lives less than a hundred meters in as the crow flies two hundred meters if you walk around uh, from me is a professional prop maker three D printer guy working Ooh. in the film industry nice um, and the, the the film list that he's worked on is rather impressive. Uh, shop tour. Several of the shop tour. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think the shop is in the village. I don't think his workshop is in the village. But I, I intend at some point to kind of, well, I th- I'm going to try and get to know him a little bit better. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm definitely going to try and interview him at some point. Um, I can of, imagine a, a proper <laughs> interview rather than a waffle. Um, some <laughs> some big films. <laughs> Him yeah. getting up in the morning, got walking to his car, getting into the car, turning to the right on the passage of the seat is Andy with like a mailbox. Like, so where are we going? Are we going to do it today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I be your intern? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, so that that that's kind of that was a, a, an interesting discovery this week. Um, mm. So I kind of I, that's certainly one I want to kind of explore, uh, find out a bit more about that, and have some conversations. So yeah, that's uh, it's been quite a busy week this week. Uh, got a busy week coming up next week, which will probably involve less things like that. But that's, that's life. That's, that's for next week's podcast. Yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. That's for next week <laughs> uh, when we will be chatting to our good friend John D. Harvey, if I remember correctly. I believe that's, so. Yeah, oh, that's nice. our guest for next week. Yeah. Yeah. Ask yeah. ask him if he has yeah. any plans with his hammer or um hammer. Um, the, anchor. um his anchor. anchor, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you, you'll just have to join in in the chat and, and ask him. Um... I, I tried to. I tried to stay up. <laughs> I suppose all that leaves now is to thank our lucky guest and ask where people can find him if they wish to stalk him. Ooh, that would be mainly on um, what well, you can go to nerdinventor.com where I have a YouTube feed and an Instagram feed and also basically a comment and contact section. Um, but mainly it's it, to get in contact with me, the, the best way is Instagram and um, yeah, YouTube. When and if, if and when I upload another video again, <laughs> but yeah. And of course, when... if people want to hear more of you, they can of course listen to Two Thirds Focused. Once they What's finish that? listening to make his waffle. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, of of course, that's like in, in a shameless plug at the end. Um, Has to be done. We do have our own podcast, uh, which is two thirds podcast, two thirds focused, which can be found on basically all the social media, because yeah. Red and Rest has been that phrase. really can't good use about all of the usual social media places because that's Steve's line. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, that's why I'm being lazy and saying all the usual social. <laughs> I don't have to put it out. People know. Exactly, exactly. And on that note, let's say good night to uh, the Indeed. few Thank people that are still us. watching us live, and and uh, goodbye to all the folk that are listening later in the week. Yeah, goodbye yeah. to everyone, and thanks guys for having me. It was great fun. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure we'll have you back at some point. Same here. Yeah. Definitely. Hope so. Well, right. we, we will at some point have the, uh, the, the the focused episode, won't we? Yes. Yes. I think that, that's going to be a must. It's going to be one of our group ones. Yes. What do you say it was going to be? Three fifths focused? We'd love to. Oh, we, we're going to find a crazy name. <laughs> Rasmus Re, Re, is going to stumble something together. Wouldn't it be, it be five thirds? Five thirds focused, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, four, four, fifth, five, sixth. We'll, we'll, so we'll come up. We'll come up with a plan before it actually yeah, happens, we'll or, that, yeah. or at some point after it happens. <laughs> we can we can take the Harry, We can take the Harry Potter logo with the um, what is train station? Focus nine and three quarters. <laughs> Uh, oh, I've yeah. my uh, Photoshop skills. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, well, on that bye, note, folks. <laughs> Thanks for Thanks having fun. me again. Bye, everyone. <laughs>